Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Please. This is the April 2nd, 2018 meeting of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners. Um, we are all present, and Commissioner Sutton has our invocation and will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, yes, if we may this morning, I want to take a few minutes to do something a little different than I feel like I've been led to do. Uh, I think invocation periods are meant to be inspirational, uh, but there's other things that can be done and said that serves the same purpose. Um, and forgive me if I ramble, I'll, I'll try not to speak too long. Yesterday a friend of mine in South Carolina sent a picture up of his family and some people in that picture are deceased now, way too early, by our standards. Uh, a brother, that died at uh, probably 69 or 70 of a heart attack. Uh, a cousin from Florence, South Carolina that passed away at age 39, brain tumor. And you sit back and you wonder why. You sit back and question maybe, possibly, but uh, in all honesty, I think we all have to realize what our purpose is in life, what it's meant to be. And I don't think the quality of life is, is based on number of years here on this planet. You know, this morning, I, and I told him yesterday, I said, you know, my wife passed away 10 years ago. And he said, I think he's, he's down in South Carolina, he said his wife had died too, and so on and so on. And then I thought, 10, 10 is not right. And I looked it up this morning. Susan's been gone 13 years, 13. And I remember when John and I were going up to her mother's when she called and said she was going. Uh, John and I were going through the country and moonlight coming through the trees. I looked at John and I said, you know, don't ever believe that we didn't get a miracle. And just because it wasn't maybe what we thought the miracle would be and or, or, or that we wanted. And But I've got to just tell you, I feel like my whole life has been driven by being led by an outside force uh, as to what I did, what my jobs were, the people that I associated with, and, and, and the uh, woman that I finally married. And I think it's just, we, we sit back and let life just roll on as fast as we can let it go, and we don't smell the roses, you know. And, <laughs> I think we all have to be dedicated to thinking, what is our purpose? What is really important? Uh, is it money? Is it prestige? Is it uh, positions that we attain? And so forth and so on. No, I don't think so. It's, it's the inner peace that I think that we all need to try to find in our hearts and in our souls and in our minds to continue as God, the God that I believe in, uh, would have us do, and definitely the God that has got me to age 68, feeling as good as I do about his purpose for me. And with that said, that's my, I hope, inspirational comment. Yeah, I didn't have to have any notes. <laughs> All right, if we can do the pledge, please. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Thank you. Um, <coughs> next on our agenda is public speakers. While we wait for, we don't have any public speakers today, so we won't be doing that. And I will forego, I've been in the habit this year of reviewing the um, public comment policy and the rules of procedure for the Alamance County Board of County Commissioners, especially the quorum of the audience. So I will forego doing that today. But please, uh, audience and people viewing this on tape, if you have any questions about the public comment policy, they're available online and I ask you to review them before you come to a meeting um, to speak. And next uh, meeting, if the board sets it, we will have 
a public hearing for an important issue. So if you intend to speak at the public hearing, please review those. All right. So we have no public speakers. Do we have any commissioner's responses to no speakers? No speakers. Okay. No, no Thank response. You. Uh, if everyone has had the opportunity to <coughs> review our agenda today, if I could have a motion for approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Uh, is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, next is the consent agenda. If everyone has had the opportunity to review the consent agenda, and uh, I move that we approve the consent agenda. Second. Thank you. <coughs> Is there any discussion? No. All in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? <coughs> All right. So the next uh, item is the National Child Abuse Prevention Month. And Valerie Chapin, our GAL District Administrator. Let's see. We have the. Do you have the. the Proclamation here, I have it. Yeah. For National Child Abuse Prevention Month. I believe uh, I'm supposed to read this. Thing. Okay. Is that right? All right. So this is a proclamation for National Child Abuse Prevention Month, whereas child maltreatment is a community problem, and finding solutions depends on involvement among people throughout the community. Whereas child maltreatment occurs when parents find themselves in stressful situations without community resources and unable to cope. Whereas 127,199 children were reported as abused and neglected in North Carolina, and 1,884 children reported in Alamance County from July 2016 to June 2017. Whereas 32 children were victims of child abuse homicide in North Carolina in 2015. Whereas child abuse costs the count country over $124 billion each year, whereas the majority of child maltreatment cases stem from situations and conditions that are preventable in an engaged and supportive community, whereas the effects of child maltreatment are felt by whole communities and need to be addressed by the entire community, whereas child maltreatment not only directly harms children, but also increases the likelihood of criminal behavior, substance abuse, health problems such as heart disease and obesity, and risky behaviors such as smoking. Whereas all citizens should be involved in supporting families raising their children in safe and nurturing environments. Whereas effective child maltreatment prevention programs succeed because of partnerships created among social service agencies, schools, faith communities, civic organizations, law enforcement agencies, and the business community. Therefore, we, the Alamance County Commissioners, do hereby proclaim April <coughs> as Child Abuse Prevention Month in Alamance County and call upon all citizens, community agencies, faith groups, medical facilities, and businesses to increase their participation in our efforts to prevent child maltreatment <coughs> and strengthen the communities in which we live, adopted the second day of April, 2018. Thank you. So on April the 10th, and thank you, commissioners, for claiming the, the month of April as um, child, abuse, uh, child Abuse Treatment of Prevention Month. But on the 10th of April, um, the Guardian and Lighting Program will be partnering with the Department of Social Services, um, Alamance Burlington School System, Crossroads Child Advocacy <coughs> Center, the Child Sexual Abuse Prevention Coalition of Alamance, and the Exchange Club's Family Center of Alamance, and that's a mouthful, um, to um, ring out child abuse down here on the um, courthouse grounds. We'll be planning 150 pinwheels representing the 150 children we advocated for in Alamance County last year, plus 32 special pinwheels representing the children that were lost in care in the state um, last year. All the districts will be, will be honoring those children lost um, in 2017. Um, it'll be at 1230. We invite you to come. It's probably, in my humble opinion, the most inspiring ceremony that you'll see um, this year. And, um, and I think several of you will be there um, speaking um, as well. And then later that afternoon, we're partnering with the uh, Graham Theater at 4 o'clock to show the movie Resilience, a documentary on the effect of trauma on children um, and as they grow into adults. Um, it's a free movie. Thank you, Graham Cinema. Um, and it'll be at 4 o'clock that afternoon. So thank you for your support.
Great. Thank you so much. I attended that event last year and look forward to it this year. Great. The um, bring out the child abuse thing at the courthouse mm -hmm. that you're talking about. So. Madam Chair, may I say something? Of course. We have this brochure or this flyer on resilience, and I've seen this movie at least three times, twice uh, shown at meetings of the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners, and once Crossroads presented it at um, the Paramount Theater. <coughs> and you all need to see this movie. It's just fantastic. And the, it's the impact of, of toxic stress and trauma on kids that last for them the rest of their lives, last with them. The, the subtitle is The Biology of Stress and the Science of Hope. And that's what the movie's all about. It's just an hour long. Thank you. Hi. Um, shall I give this to you now? Yes, that'd be great. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right, and then we have a proclamation for uh, Public Health Month with the Health Department. Good morning. Good morning. So I'm here to present, um, actually I'm not going to be reading the proclamation. We have a special guest from the health department reading the proclamation today. But we are here to present uh, the proclamation to uh, make aware that April is Public Health Month. And um, just a special note that we are celebrating 80 years of public health in Alamance County this year. So with that, I'd like to introduce our Linda Ellison who is our health education supervisor <coughs> at the health department who will present you the proclamation. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Whereas we hereby recognize and acknowledge 80 years of public health service to the residents of Alamance County, as well as the vast contributions of these services to the quality of life in our communities, and whereas public health plays a crucial role in the foundation of good health and quality of life lived by working to immunize people against disease, by working to control environmental health hazards and infectious disease, by improving the health of mothers and children, and promoting healthy behaviors in areas of tobacco use, physical activity, and nutrition. And whereas the Alamance County Health Department is an active partner in the county's emergency response to natural and man-made disasters, and is a critical component in the response to widespread disease outbreaks in our community in which local health providers and partners dedicated more than 1,285 hours to public health preparedness and response planning in the last year. And whereas public health plays a critical role in eliminating health inequities and preventing chronic disease and injuries, resulting in improved productivity and decreased health health care costs for all Alamance County residents, and whereas a continued focus on prevention in Alamance County resulted in nearly 8,100 dental health visits, 2,800 environmental health inspections, evaluations, and specimens collected, 11,400 personal health, and that includes immunizations, maternity, child health, family planning, and behavioral health visits, 12,400 WIC counseling sessions, 12,500 care coordination contacts, and 3,300 community health education outreach encounters in 2017, providing health and wellness opportunities and programs to benefit Alamance County residents. <coughs> and whereas public health strives to protect everyone who lives, works, or visits Alamance County, from health threats and disasters through the successful use of new and existing initiatives and collaborative partnerships with a multitude of agencies in the community to find solutions to health issues. Now, therefore, we proclaim April 2018 as Public Health Month in Alamance County and urge our citizens to recognize that public health is working to ensure that all residents of Alamance County are healthy. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I have the proclamation here for everybody to sign. Do you have anything else? No, just thank you for your time. Um, we're happy to be doing the work of public health in Alamance County. And like I said, we're celebrating 80 years. Um, we've come a long way that in 1938, you had a health director and a nurse. And that is it. 
Um, and so the infrastructure for public health, not only in Alamance County, but the state and the nation has grown a lot. So thank you for your support. Great, thank you. Does anybody have any questions or anything to add? All right, thank you so much. Thank you. And I'll pass this around for everybody to sign it. All right, next on our agenda is the uh, Alamance Burlington School System Lottery Fund request with Dr. Todd Thorpe. Is he perhaps yeah, in the overflow room? Awesome. How about we, all right, I'll we'll just go on. Look, Madam Chair, to see you just make sure he's not we'll outside. Just, no. Yeah, just take a quick look for him. It's unusual for him not to be here, so. And he's here very one, often. One of the board members is here. Steve, have you seen him this morning? Mr. Steve. Van Pelt, have you seen Dr. Thorpe no, this morning? Not. He's not here. All right. Well, we'll skip over that, and we'll um, if he turns up, then we will. <laughs> Would we go um, back to it? Uh, Steve, do we need to approve this today in case he doesn't come? I, I think it was. There was some timing issues for the school system. It would mm -hmm. be. Uh, it would be in the best interest of these projects if it could be approved. That's today. what I'm thinking because uh, I was there when they did. Wait and see I'll make like the motion we approve. All right. If that's what you, you know. Why don't you read? Could you read the, what he's asking for? So. Sure. Hold on just a second. I got my documentation down here. <coughs> All right, ABSS is requesting lottery funds for various school repairs. Total projected cost is $707,634. Um, as of February 28, 2018, an, an allocated balance was $2,970,880.09. Once approved by the North Carolina Department of Public Construction, the balance will be $2,000,000. $263,246.09. So um, the lottery funds requested, there is a list which I think was included with the agenda packet yes, so that the public could review that ahead of time and the commissioners could review that. Um, we already have a motion that we approve these lottery funds, this lottery fund request. I'll second that then. And we have a second. Is there any discussion? And all in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Great. Thank you so much, gentlemen. All right. Got a lot of work going on up here. So next we have the Justice Advisory Council appointment. Um, Mr. Haygood. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning uh, to the commissioners. Uh, the Justice Advisory Council has five positions on that council that are appointed by the Board of County Commissioners. There is currently a vacancy for a representative from the faith-based community. Uh, the, there, we've solicited applications and received two. Uh, applications were submitted by Mr. Ralph Emerson and Mr. Reginald Davis. The Justice Advisory uh, Council Executive Committee has reviewed both of these applications and is recommending that the Board of Con Commissioners consider appointing Mr. Ralph Emerson uh, for this appointment. So there are two. Uh, they should both be in your packet, uh, Mr. Emerson and Mr. Davis, and the council has a re is recommended Mr. Emerson today. Mr. Emerson is not here. He was, uh, we contacted him. He's not able to be here. He had already planned an out of town trip. So. All right. So this is an agenda item that does require a vote. Um, so I guess that the Justice Advisory Council will be seeking a motion to approve the appointment of Mr. Emerson. Yes, ma'am. Since I'm the commissioner representative on the advisory council, I'll go ahead and uh, make a motion to approve the executive committee of the joint of the Justice Advisory Council's recommendation uh, to approve Ralph Emerson. They're both really excellent candidates. Great. <coughs> Is there a second or any discussion? I'll make a second that we approve Ralph Hermann, sir. Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? <coughs> Thank you. All right, now we have an audit contract from the finance department. 
Good morning, Commissioners. Um, before you is our annual contract to be approved with Martin Starnes and Associates to do our auditing, auditing services for the current fiscal year. Um, these audit contracts have to be approved by the LGC, so we're bringing it before you this morning. Um, there is an increase in their fee um, to $98,000, which is about $37,000 more than what we're currently paying. That is due to the State Auditor's Office determining that certain direct benefits will no longer be reported on our statement of schedules. Um, they have to be reported only on the state, so that will require additional work for our auditors as well as implementing compliance changes to the uh, other post-employment benefit standards that are changing in the fiscal year 18 as well. I've got a question. The last time we did this contract with them was 2016, is that correct? That's the last year we put it out for bid. We put it out for a three-year bid, so it would go out for bid next fiscal year. Go out next year yes, for sir. bid, okay. I'd like to comment that uh, one of the issues that comes up at the um, Commissioner's Association Board of Directors, it, particularly in the smaller counties, but really across the state, there aren't a lot of firms that are doing uh, county audits anymore because of the requirements associated right. with them, and it's just not, I guess, a profitable business for them, perhaps, and the, 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 time, the, the time and the yeah. skill sets really that is. are required. Uh, but um, I just... I'm not uh, trying to point out anything other than that, just that. Well, I think that, next year when that time comes, yeah. we'll put it out and exactly. you just go where you yeah. go with that. Yes, sir. Where are they based out now? They're based out of Hickory. And they had a three-year contract, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. I'll, I'll make a motion that we Wait a minute. Oh, okay. If, if, they're, if they made a contract three years ago, do they not have to stick by that price that they gave us? Well, with these are added um, additional hours that they would uh -huh. have to work, mandated by the state, uh, we could certainly go back and ask them for... I think we need to do that. I, yeah. I don't think we ought to raise their price if they, if they negotiated that contract. Am I wrong, Clyde? What do you think? Well, the state has applied new mandates to it that weren't part of the original contract. Well, did the contract the reflect possible changes that could come along? <clears throat> no, sir. In a, in a generic sense. Mm. Well, could, that, right. could that be yeah. considered a change of scope of services? How to think about a contract they could have anticipated when right. they entered into the How time sensitive is this to get it done right this month? Um, we have to have an approved contract by May 31st. I would say go back to them and do a little negotiating. We can do that. That sounds like that's the pleasure you. of the board. So. Well, I just want to say this. I mean, I, we're probably going to have to go, go with it. But when we do contracts, it's just like PART. When we did the contract with PART, there should have been something possibly or some, with somebody that if they ride around with empty buses, uh, we're not going to tax or fee uh, a private enterprise company in our county. I mean, there's, there's got to be, uh, everything's got to be covered even if it's just generic comments and i just don't see that we do that much but anyway all right well then we will expect to be hearing about that at the next meeting next on our agenda approval of lease with hedgehog buildings mr baker good morning commissioners i'm morning. here on behalf of the recreation and parks department uh, to seek approval for a lease of some office space in the glencoe mill village uh, hedgehog holdings is the company that owns the uh, majority of the buildings in Glencoe. Frank Gaylord is the owner of that business, and he has given us a pretty good rate on some office space there. Uh, it serves dual purposes for us. We've got some overcrowding uh, at Pleasant Grove Community Center, where our staff is currently located for the Northern Division. But I think more importantly, it gives us a space to um, open to the public on the Hall River Trail in the Glencoe Mill Village. Uh, we don't have any office space, any people stationed anywhere along the river um, and it's getting more than 300,000 visitors a year now so we need a place for people to go on a Saturday and get a map have some questions answered um, this space will serve that purpose for us also would allow us to do some educational classes it's it's a lot of space so it's about 1300 square feet in Glencoe Mill Village he's given us a pretty good deal of uh, $600 a month um, so we'd like to move forward with this lease it's only a little over five dollars per square foot per year that's it's a pretty that's fair deal very low and that includes utilities i think you like our presence there as well 
Where, where's the city of Arlington? I know they were going to go in that one building. And I think those plans have, have changed and okay. canceled. Yeah. I'll make the motion we uh, <clears throat> approve this. Before we, is that going to require any extra staffing? No, it's actually given us a place for our staff to go now. We've got but no extra, nobody extra, just no. bringing them in a little closer, just giving them <laughs> space to put a computer somewhere. Yeah, where is it in relation to um, Highway 62? So, like, if you were going 62 north and you turn, go over the bridge and you turn left to go to the Glencoe Mill Village, mm -hmm. where is this particular building in relation to? There's a string of buildings in different states of use. Right. Along the river there. So this building is the machine shop, which probably doesn't help much. But as you enter the village, the, the mill proper is on the left, uh, and you'll come the next cluster of buildings on the on the top of the hill there. It's one of those. So it's right next right to the, the museum. Oh, okay. Yeah. Next to the right museum. Right next to the museum. So we'll get a lot of that cross track. <coughs> right. Mm -hmm. So I saw something in the budget about um, managing the textile museum or so that, that there is a this particular completely state. separate proposal for that. Yeah. Uh, there's been some discussions with the folks who run the Textile Heritage Museum about uh, us assisting with that, but that's a budget issue, and this is just separate. It would, it would, if we do that, this space would help. Right, that's what I was asking. Yeah. But, but this is kind of a separate need. So. Yeah. Well, I'll second that motion. Great. We have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Then all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you, Mr. Baker. <coughs> All right, trade-in of surplus property. I believe this is a policy matter, is that right? Indeed, it is. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, what you have uh, in your packet and before you this morning is a new policy for county government that uh, dictates how we do trade-ins of surplus property, and particularly vehicles. Um, this, this policy would allow uh, county departments to trade one or more used vehicles toward the purchase of a new used vehicle. Uh, this only applies to used vehicles. We have different uh, procedures in place for new, new, new vehicles. Um, but the policy uh, <coughs> indicates that the county must receive book value for any trade-in. So if the county is going to trade a vehicle for another vehicle, we must get whatever the book value is for our trade. And the policy also indicates uh, we cannot pay more than book value for the uh, new used vehicle. Um, and this is all in line with state purchasing policy as far as um, uh, purchasing used vehicles goes. Uh, any tray like this would be reviewed by our purchasing department as well as county manager's office would have a chance to look it over. And then the final trade agreement would be brought to the county board of commissioners for approval. So uh, the, thing, the main things to take away from this new policy is that you can trade more than one vehicle. You could trade two used cars for one new used car, but you would have to be getting book value all around. We'd have to be getting book value for the trades and no more paying no more than book uh, for the new one that we're getting. So um, it does require approval by the Board of Commissioners, and we'll be happy to answer any questions if you have any about it. What did we do before? Uh, we, we've kind of uh, – the state contract only applies to new, and so you can't go bid used vehicles. So we've had, uh, most of the time I think departments have sold on gov deals, deals. their used vehicles, which uh, <clears throat> sometimes brings in significantly less than the book value. Uh, and the funds have gone back to general fund as, a, as opposed to going to help offset the cost of the new used vehicle. Yeah. So with this policy in place, a department could, if they could get a better deal on a trade that's book value, then they think they could get on gov deals, which is oftentimes the case, it'll help offset the cost of the new acquisition. So. Is this a new statute that's come about at state, or is this? I think it's a great idea. Yeah. Sorry. It's just a deviation from our current policy. We've yeah, been I using gov deals, idea, and we think we can yeah. get we think we can get more money on a trade <coughs> if we use book value. I would so. think you would too. Yeah. Makes good sense. But it does require a. I'll vote. make a motion that we approve it. I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion or any questions? <coughs> Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right. Next on our agenda, uh, talking about where we're going to have our April 16th meeting. <clears throat> Uh, commissioners, next, uh, the April 16th meeting is going to be a busy time. Uh, we're going to have our public hearing for the uh, Alamance Burlington School System and Community College bonds uh, if we go forward with that process today. We'll also be hearing uh, budget presentations from the school system and the community college. 
and, and we'll talk a little bit during the presentation about the budget today about whether or not you want outside agencies to come. So we could have a significant number of folks at the April 16th meeting. Now, I would suggest to the board we consider relocating, leave it an evening meeting, still 7 o'clock, but uh, relocate to another place. And I think uh, uh, we were going to maybe talk about where that location could be. We could always go to the uh, historic courthouse, but you may want to have this particular meeting somewhere else. So. Um, I had thought maybe we would have, lots of times we have these uh, meetings that are expected to be heavily attended at Williams High School. I had wondered if the board wanted to consider going to Cummings High School or Southern Alamance High School to um, sort of uh, give geographic proximity to a different group of people. But I'd, like to, I'd like to see us go to Southern. The Southern big enough, I've been in their auditorium, but it's a small one. Do, uh, what, do you know the capacity at Southern? Uh, I'm not sure what the capacity is there. I know it's uh, it would be significantly more than the right. historic courthouse. I think we're 250 yeah. or 300 yeah. at the historic, so it'd be a lot. No. Mm -hmm. Williams is obviously the largest of all of them, yeah, but uh, uh, anything. I think Williams is just too big for this. That's my opinion. Mm -hmm. It don't matter to me where we go. I'm, I'm good with Southern. Okay. I was there a couple weeks ago for the um, FFA had a bluegrass concert fundraiser, which was fantastic. And it was still seats available in there for that. I believe it wasn't, you know, yeah, back not, then like sorry. I don't think we have that Yeah. So. If the if the board is interested in Southern, then uh, if you want to uh, proceed with voting to change the location, then we will coordinate that uh, with the uh, school system. I think the, the venue itself is good, but uh, Cummings is a little more centrally located in the county, if that matters. I mean, it's, it, uh, but on the other hand, it might be good we for may, people to see. We may save that for the next one that we have to do. Yeah, well, that's for the, <laughs> for the, we the budget. Big ones coming up. Will this, will, will yeah. this be the overall budget hearing? No, this will, no. This will uh, for be the for bonds, the bond, right. the part right. of the bond process. So and maybe the, for the budget hearing, we can think about Cummings. Yeah. I, would, I would say let maybe look at doing that. I make a motion we go to Southern at our next meeting. I'll second. And Tori, send us a reminder. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have a motion and a second. Is there any more discussion? <clears throat> I do like the idea myself of going to Southern, being a person who lives outside city limits and has to travel a lot. I feel for people who live in Snow Camp and Eli Whitney, how far it is they have to drive. So it's nice to um, to spread it around sometimes. So um, if there's no further discussion, then all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, thank you so much. <clears throat> and then we have the Alamance County budget preliminary presentations today. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, you have in your uh, packets, and also we provided hard copies today uh, for you, uh, copies mm -hmm. of the um, PowerPoint presentation that I'm preparing to go through, as well as you, all, uh, you have a copy of the snapshots for all county departments that are there before you, and we also have copies of um, outside agency apps and, uh, and are in your packet. So um, what I'm going to do this morning is go through a summary of the requests that we've had from county departments and from outside agencies. Uh, you'll need to note that we have not formally received uh, 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 the budget a request from Alamance Department of the School System, and Dr. Gatewood will be coming on the 16th to present his budget request to the uh, commissioners at that time. So the numbers you'll see today do not reflect the addition of Alamance Community College or Alamance Department of the School System. Um, so I'll go through a summary of county government. We have department heads or representatives from each county department here today, either with us in this room or over in Overflow. So if you have seen something in your packet that you have a question about, or as I go through, you have a question, just stop me. We'll get the appropriate department staff uh, to answer your questions. And then the uh, once I'm uh, complete with this presentation, the sheriff, uh, Stacy <coughs> Saunders with Health, and Susan Osborne with the Department of Social Services are going to give you additional information about their budget. So, with no further ado, we'll go ahead and begin. <coughs> well, I've got it on. You may have to advance me manually, Bruce. Sorry. <coughs> so at, at this point, uh, we've, we've received budget requests from all of our county departments and our outside agencies, and uh, we've tallied them all up. We're formulating a budget, so this is a budget in process. So 
Uh, at this time, we've received a little over $155 million worth of uh, requests from county departments outside agencies. Again, that does not reflect uh, the school system or the community college. Uh, at this time, county government out of that $155 million accounts for a little over $106 million. And you can see it drills down a little bit further. <coughs> county services, that's our actual county department, costs a little over $93 million worth of requests. Uh, we have our mental health uh, MOE funds in there at $1.2 million. We're also looking at uh, a little over $9.8 million in debt service this year. We're uh, planning to transfer for other funds to a little over $2 million. That is the vast majority of that is uh, sales tax uh, uh, restricted revenues that will be going into the school system's capital reserve per our plan that you've been seeing so often. So that's right in line with our plan uh, for next fiscal year for school system. And I also believe $257,000 of that is uh, county government's uh, yes. annual share. But we'll talk about all that in just a moment. And we're looking at uh, $130,000 for contingency. So when you see the education funds there, it's 45 million of that 155 million total asked. But again, those are based on 16, um, excuse me, 1718 requests. That is not current. We'll be current very soon after April 16th. And then our outside agencies make up a little over um, $3.3 million worth of that 155 million. Next slide, please, Bruce. So at this point, uh, in, the, in the request we've received from the departments, we've had a total request of 14 and a half new positions. Uh, of those, uh, general government positions are uh, account for three. <coughs> Public safety, we've had a request for five new positions. Uh, cultural resources, two and a half new positions. And human services, uh, four new positions. And I will go through each of these and give you the details about what these positions are. We've had one request for a new career ladder from the Board of Elections. Kathy was unable to be here today, uh, but uh, she did want me to stress to you how important she believes this career ladder is. Uh, she's coming up on a major election, and this is a way for her to help retain experienced people and encourage her newer people to continue to be trained. So I want to relay that information to you. She has, she has clearly related to me that it is important to her and her department. Um, we also have some position reclassifications in uh, the budget request for veteran services. That is for the director of veteran services and the both veteran service officers. Next slide, thank you. So a little more detail about these position requests. Uh, the tax department is asking for a new position, a real estate transfer clerk. Uh, what's going on is we are just having, we're having so much economic activity in Alamance County, properties changing hands, properties being developed. Uh, the days that it takes uh, uh, to get a uh, record from recordation over to, um, from tax over to the register of deeds and get all that cleared up has uh, gone up tremendously. I think we're uh, over 45 days now. Which, as you can imagine, if you're in the business of property selling and buying, that's a long time for, to wait to make sure records are cleared. Uh, <coughs> Jeremy's folks are doing all they can with the number of people that they have. And we have seen this timing delay continue to increase as uh, sales uh, have continued to increase here. So it's a needed position. Also in the IT department, we have uh, requests for two positions. Uh, one is a new tech specialist to serve almost entirely no one but emergency services. Our emergency service departments continue to grow, and as they add people and resources, it's a lot of technology addition, uh, and so IT is asking for a new person there. And also for a new network tech in general, um, uh, they need, uh, as our county government continues to grow, we're becoming more and more technologically uh, reliant in areas particularly of HIPAA. Uh, the IT department's made it clear that they would uh, benefit greatly from a new person in their network tech pool. And in public safety, uh, we've had a request from CECOM for four new telecommunicator positions. Uh, as people continue to move into the county, uh, we are experiencing higher and higher call volumes. The number of calls from 911, as well as the amount of radio traffic out to all the agencies that CECOM serves continues to go up. Uh, we serve uh, all the fire and law enforcement in the county with just very few exceptions. And those cities continue to add people. And as they add employees to their police and fire, CECOM traffic grows and grows and grows. Yes, sir. So in my experience, four positions for a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week operation is essentially one person all the time covering that. Is that what this? Yes. Yes. And does that require any additional equipment, like another station? No, they're, they're set up right now to be able to accommodate this uh, if it were approved. And one thing that we 
our hopeful of CECOM is one of our highest turnover. Uh, this particular position, telecommunicator, is one of our top uh, nine positions. I think uh, they are like number four uh, in the hierarchy of how the turnover rate. So we're hoping by bringing in more people and reducing call volumes to employees that will help uh, with retention too. Um, so uh, we also have a request from our inspections department for a new code inspector. Uh, as you can imagine, if you ride around Alamance County, you can see all the building that's going on today. Uh, inspections is extremely busy. And uh, Robert Key does a very good job of setting uh, good benchmarks. He has 24-hour turnaround for plan review, uh, a very quick turnaround for getting the inspector to your site. Uh, he's made it clear to me that if we want to continue to keep that high, that high quality of service with low delays, uh, we're, we're probably going to need another inspector to be able to do that. So. Do we uh, do any intergovernmental uh, work with Burlington or other municipalities on this? We we do. We provide service for. Uh, say I believe we provide service for the um, town of Hall River, uh, the town of Elon. I think we do uh, for the town of Gibsonville too. And then we have some interlocal agreements where um, they will come and help us if they can. They're pretty busy too. Burlington. Uh, Gray, uh, Burlington, Graham, and Bevan do their own inspections, but uh, we have we have called on them in the past, and way, they've called on us too, especially if they've had you know a very large project and they need they need help. The way the college is growing, up, I'd about sign somebody full time over there, couldn't you? <laughs> it's crazy with no tax dollars coming. <laughs> and the library is requesting uh, one and a half positions, uh, one full time position. That would be uh, you know, the library is working diligently to raise funds for the new bookmobile. Uh, they're uh, <coughs> requesting to be able to hire a new person that would actually, a full-time person that would be responsible for driving the bookmobile, managing it, keeping uh, the resources up to date on it, as well as programming it. Um, and they're also asking for a part-time person to assist with that. So both of these positions, one full-time and one part-time, would be involved with the, um, with the bookmobile. And the Parks Department is asking for uh, one new position, a museum manager. This goes to the uh, question that Commissioner Bird had uh, for Brian Baker. Uh, we've been approached by the folks that operate the Textile Heritage Museum, George and Jerry Nall. I'm sure many of you know George and Jerry. They've poured their lives into the Textile Heritage Museum and have made it really some, uh, a very special place in Alamance County. And they're interested in its future and its sustainability and uh, have talked with the county through the Parks Department about the possibility of partnering with them in a little more uh, hands-on way uh, the county would be in this case providing one full-time employee that would work there and uh, and management manage it uh, per instructions from George and Jerry too I'm sure um, is that something that would be funded by the occupancy tax instead of coming out of our general fund I think that's something we're going to look at you know we have uh, we have at least one new request this year for occupancy tax funding but uh, we have not yet uh, done projections for occupancy tax so uh, this would be a, re a legitimate use of occupancy tax funds by our statute and museums as one of those uh, operations that we can support. So it's possible if we're not able to get this into the county's operating budget, uh, we can look at op uh, occupancy tax funds too. That would be the only way I would support that. I think I'm, I'm just saying we're getting too big, adding too many employees, and uh, I'm not going to support it if we can't pay for it through the occupancy tax. Thank you. I would tend to agree with that, that we have the inspections needs and CECOM needs and um, education needs. So, if, but if it works out with the occupancy tax, then that's a whole nother Thank thing. you. Thank you. Well, that's, that's, that's good input for me to hear. I appreciate that. And again, as I go through these, if you have comments like, you know, we don't do a formal retreat as we have done in the past. It's, it, it's proved very difficult to get the board together on dates other than uh, the, the established meeting dates. Y'all are so busy, uh, very busy folks. So th this, is, this is serving as a retreat. So if you have questions or comments, let us know. We will make notations of what you have to say and uh, we will certainly carry that with us as we're putting together the recommended budget. So. So uh, the Department of Social Services is asking for a total of four positions, and uh, Susan Osmer will be speaking to you in just a few moments about the need for these. Uh, I've met with Susan and, uh, and understand that in uh, their Child Protective Service uh, Agency, they have a significant need. They have quite a, a crisis going on at this time. Uh, they, uh, as you can see on this slide, just a brief 
the uh, summary, they've, they've had a significant increase in referrals to Child Protective Services, as well as turnover. Um, uh, this is another one of the positions that uh, we analyzed our, our uh, county government for turnover, and we came up with our top nine, and this social worker, uh, A&T, and I'm afraid the A&T escapes my memory, Susan. Investigation, uh, assessment, and treatment. One of the top, in the top nine, this is a very high turnover position, as you can imagine, dealing with child protective services, just that type of work, mm -hmm. as well as uh, the, the amount of cases that they have to handle. Um, so Susan's going to talk to you more about this, but this is a, uh, a very pressing need uh, in next year's budget for, for consideration. So uh, a couple of other things to talk about that are not necessarily, uh, these are not new employee requests, but uh, that go along with some of our, our employee compensation plan. You know, we did our, uh, our pay study several years ago, and we've tried to look at how could we afford a 2.1%, this is a half step in our plan, a half step in the county's pay plan is 2.1%. Uh, so each year we've looked at how, how could we afford uh, at least a half step uh, pay increase for county employees. Uh, I've looked at, uh, my initial look at the budget was to just look at what could we do for emergency service personnel. Of our top nine turnover positions, uh, one, two, three, four, I believe five of those are in emergency services. So that, that tells me that, you know, we have high turnover in those positions. We know that. So uh, for a 2.1% for a pay increase uh, for emergency services, we're looking at a little over $450,000. For all county employees, for all departments, you would add another $559,000 in order to uh, afford a pay increase uh, at 2.1%. We're also this year uh, going to Continue, we're going to try to continue our track that we've been on about uh, increasing our contribution for uh, in county employee health insurance. I think at this time today we're $1.6 million in the, in the hole in our insurance fund. Susan ran those numbers uh, just very recently. So we're going to have to up our um, increase to that, uh, to that fund. And we're looking at doing it to the tune of a little over $786,000 for next fiscal year. Uh, we feel like that is, that is a very important piece of this budget. It, we, we have got to work, uh, in my opinion, to get ourselves to a place where we're paying our bills annually at least. Uh, it would also be great to get to a place where we have money and savings as we have had in the past. Um, at one point we had uh, uh, over $10 million in our savings account in our employee health insurance. So today we're $1.6 in the hole. Uh, we're, we're just having to go up in our, in our uh, contribution for that fund. We're also seeing uh, in workers' comp we have a fund very similar to the employee health insurance. The workers' compensation fund runs the same way. We've noticed that uh, it's starting to dip into the savings account and, and workers' comp, and uh, so I'm not, I'm not too keen on that. I don't like that idea. I'd like to keep us level. Uh, that would, If we do that, we'll take another $190,000 uh, additional funding uh, for workers' comp. And we're also looking at some mandatory retirement increases that the state is uh, requiring the county to pay. Total and mandatory retirement uh, increases is a little over $84,000. And you can see there uh, how that breaks down. Uh, we would be increasing a quarter percent uh, retirement pay for uh, law enforcement and 0.19% for all other uh, county employees. And we're also this year uh, being required by the state to do a contribution to the Retired Sheriff's Association in the amount of $17,000. So uh, next, uh, next little bit of information we're going to be talking about is equipment. Uh, the requests from the departments at this time are a little over. Yes, sir. Can I go back to health insurance for just a minute? Yes. Do you feel comfortable that we're doing all the wellness programs to help keep our uh, health insurance costs down? I would say before this calendar year, no. I think that we've moved to this new <coughs> model where we're for employees to keep their insurance no cost, you have to do certain things that include biometric screening, your annual, annual physicals, um, and you also take an online health risk assessment through Cigna. I think now that that data is starting to come in, uh, Sherry will attest, uh, our employees have, have uh, overwhelmingly gone to do their physicals. We're getting those reports back from Cigna. And uh, our, I think all of our signups are booked for all of our biometric screenings. Uh, and the response rate for the online health risk assessment is through the roof. Cigna will help us take that data that they, we don't see that information. We don't get 
the private employee data, Cigna will be able to get that and help us tailor wellness programs specifically for trend needs. And I think that is going to help us. And can, do you have a sense uh, about the, um, our increasing costs, uh, are they due more to utilization of services or is the price that we're paying for unit of service going up? And is Cigna managing those contracts with the healthcare providers to keep those unit costs down? I think I would have to defer to uh, Sherry. If she, Sherry, would you be able to speak to Commissioner Bird's question? Yeah, um, I would say it's a little bit of a combination of both, but what we're seeing mainly is that our costs are increasing from high dollar claimants. So in the past where we did not have um, employees who had enough um, claims to reach our stop loss, this past year we had four that reached the stop loss um, right now, they are tracking 10 cases that are over $50,000 right now. So what we're thinking is that um, doing the biometric screenings and helping people go get their physicals will help them screen for things that can be preventable. When we are at least caught, when we looked, um, talked with Cigna this past week of the 10 claims that they found, um, seven of those could have been screened out. So they may, may have still, some of them were cancer, so they may have still gotten the cancer, but could have caught it a little bit quicker. So we feel like we're putting things in place. Um, and as far as the discounts, we feel like Cigna's doing what they need to do, um, working with uh, getting those agreements in place. Right. Okay. Thank you. And th this, Commissioner I will say this is going to be an ever-increasing cost. I think that is the trend across <laughs> the United States in all private and public sectors. Uh, it's something that we're going to have to give thought to in the future about how we offer uh, this benefit. I'll just tell you because it is an expensive benefit. Current employees are covered. Current employees will always be covered. Uh, but it is something that I think I could foresee in the future. We're going to have to think about do we continue to offer um, this, this, uh, the, the, the benefits that we offer to new employees, to new hires. Uh, it's a great recruitment tool. It is. Uh, that's the truth. And we need it. We need to use it that way, but we're going to have to look to find a balance uh, for how to continue to offer it because these cost $786,000. Uh, that's a significant amount of our, uh, could be a significant amount of our new revenue that you'll see in just a moment. So it's, it's, it's making it more difficult for us to stay at uh, uh, our current revenue sources, it's, it, this is going to make it difficult to stay there, I think, and do all the things that we want to do. So uh, we were talking a little bit about equipment. We've had a little over $400,000 in requests from county departments. Uh, Maintenance department's asking for $20,000 to do some new locks uh, for portions of county government uh, for buildings. Uh, the CECOM, our Central Communications <coughs> Department, has a microwave project that has to do with VHF communications. It's going, if, uh, if approved, almost $300,000 to improve VHF communications around Alamance County. Uh, the Health Department's asking for <coughs> little, uh, almost $14,000 to replace several uh, vaccine refrigerators that are in, at the end of their lives. Uh, there's a grant for $12,000 for the Department of Social Services over the Family Justice Center that would do uh, uh, security work to the doors that lead into the building. And the Parks Department is asking for close to $60,000 for various pieces of uh, equipment that you see listed there. Vehicles this year for county government, uh, the total is over $750,000 for vehicles. Sheriff's Department uh, requesting 12 replacement vehicles at the cost of $350,000. The Emergency Medical Services Department is requesting $350,000 for uh, an ambulance replacement, one remount, and uh, a new a replacement medic unit for one of the medic units that's in the field now. And our Parks Department is asking for uh, a little over $55,000 for two new uh, pickups. Can, can I ask the sheriff a question? Sir? How many vehicles does the sh sheriff's department have? We have about 140, I think 47. So this is just a, a small percentage of the total fleet that needs to be yes, replaced. Sir. Indeed. And those vehicles are driven hard and uh, we, we put at least average of 25,000 miles on every patrol vehicle every year. We keep them about four. So basically, you don't get much on that trade in value. Well, that was one of the reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say I wouldn't buy them after it was over. 
I think it was, that was the reason we were talking about going away from drug deals and maybe trying to do book value because it just we feel like we'll get uh, departments like the sheriff in particular uh, higher value on the trade. So uh, we have a request from the library for uh, this is other other equipment, other materials, a little over two hundred fifty thousand dollars for uh, library books and audiovisual materials that they would uh, be purchasing in eighteen nineteen. And we also have a request for uh, almost two hundred fifty thousand dollars in other improvements. IT department's requesting uh, $81,000 to do, uh, again, we're, our buildings as they age, we're updating our security and our lock systems for our buildings, trying to make all that centralized one system able to be controlled, you know, as we use our cars to come in out of this building, you hit hitting door locks. It's, uh, it's a much easier way for us to be able to manage access to buildings, uh, and uh, it's, it's certainly the security way of the future. Uh, the maintenance department is asking for close to $55,000. This is, this is for projects that are under $10,000. We have two types of projects in our maintenance department. We have capital projects that are greater than $10,000. That's, uh, we'll be talking about those in just a moment. That, that total is a little over $250,000. Then we have projects that departments need all across county government that are under $10,000. So uh, Buddy Weitzel puts out the call uh, a couple months ago saying, tell me your, your under $10,000 projects. And the total this year is a little over $54,000. And we also have a request from the Recreation Park Department in the amount of $112,000. This is to uh, do work to the Garrett House, the historic uh, home out at Cedar Rock Park, to remove a part of that property that is really not in theme with the actual history of the home. And then uh, I believe the, the remainder of it is a grant match to help uh, install the new equestrian complex out at Cedar Rock Park. You know, the county used. Uh, grant funds from every source possible to purchase the 170 <coughs> acres adjacent to the park when it came up for sale. And I believe the parks have a grant in place or some, uh, maybe PM funding I think was gonna help offset the construction of a new equestrian complex, a barn. Uh, the department's already constructed uh, horse camping areas and a new entrance for these horse trailers to use specifically to get in and out of Cedar Rock Park. So uh, some of these funds will be used to help build the new barn where people can bring their horses uh, and, and ride, as well as I think the department would have some horses on site that people would be able to, to rent. Brian, would there, there be some, I'm going to ask Brian Baker, would there be some uh, revenue generated from that? I think so. Uh, trying to figure out exactly what the model is going to be. I mean, I would think you'd be able to go, generate enough to cover kind of keeping that up. for the rides and uh, how that balances out. Well, Do you charge a rental for the folks that come and spend the night there? And yeah. What are the fees for that? I think it's 20. Yeah, let me check, but I think it's 20 and a half. Okay. And it's a, it's a nice addition to the park. Uh, the, uh, the new entrance is specifically for the rigs with horses, so they, they'll just use that entrance. They'll have a parking area just for themselves. Uh, they have slots where they can camp, and then it, the air, that area is connected by trail to the rest of the, to that, the, rest that, of the trails that, in the park area is really used on the weekends. Oh, gosh. Mm -hmm. I've been out there and it'll be 15 or 20 of uh, those rigs sitting out there with, with horses on them. Yes, that's a great attraction. They use them. Yeah. Very well used. Mm -hmm. So uh, speaking of our capital improvement plan, uh, this year we've been averaging $250,000. We're a little higher than that this year. The request for $257,500. You see the projects listed here. And again, this this is in line with our capital plan that we've been talking about uh, uh, that coincides with ADSS, ACC, and county government. We have several buildings that are uh, in need of roofs, but you'll notice it says subject to facilities plan. Two of these buildings, environmental health and crime scene investigations, are both buildings that uh, need roofing badly. We've been patching them. They either need to have the roof replaced or we need to either demo them or get out of them. And we're, we have held off on making long-term roofing commitments until we know for sure what the future for those buildings are. But uh, we're, we're uh, working on selecting our uh, facility planner, so we hope to have all this in place. But we're going ahead and budgeting for the roofs in the event uh, uh, they are uh, needed for next year. HVAC needs over in civil courts, which is right next door to us, second floor is $20,000. Uh, we're also uh, requesting $53,000 to install generators at our two um, EMS substations out at Rudd Street and Boone Station so they can continue to have a guaranteed power when the, the lights go out. We're also uh, requesting $70,000 to do uh, refurbishment work to the elevator 
here in the county office building. I think the elevator here and the elevators under the Department of Social Services both uh, have reached the end of their, their useful lives. Uh, we're probably taking a chance every time you get on it and press the button. So it's time to do refurbishment Thanks work to, to all of them. But this year we're looking at the one here at county office, but yes, so we'll motion and the audience will probably now take the stairs down too. <laughs> but, um, okay, next slide please. And we have, a, we have a plan from our landfill, uh, from their capital needs. Now you know the landfill fund is standalone, it's an enterprise fund. Uh, the landfill is planning to spend uh, $568,000 for their capital next year. Uh, you can see the vast majority of that is in equipment, a new skid steer, and uh, to rebuild one of their very large caterpillars uh, on the property. They're also requesting to be able to spend $25,000 to purchase a fuel efficient car. They're currently traveling back and forth to Graham or anywhere they go uh, for meetings or seminars or trainings. Now they use some of their large trucks, so I think they feel like that uh, purchasing a fuel efficient car would be in their best interest. They're also planning to do uh, $25,000 worth of repairs to the scale house, the one that is there now. Um, and they're uh, requesting $72,000 to do some other improvements uh, to purchase some open top dumpsters uh, for the landfill site, as well as some paving projects they need to do on the roads in and out. And all that would come out of their enterprise fund? Yes, yes. So those, those, uh, you know, uh, those funds are, no, no county tax dollars are going in to support the landfill. It's all, uh, it's all fee based. So for next fiscal year, fiscal year 1819, uh, our total outstanding debt as of July 1 will be a little over $53 million. You can see how it breaks out. Uh, the county doesn't have any bond debt. We have uh, $5.8 million worth of installment debt. You see the debt listed there for Alamance Burlington School System, bonds and installments and then uh, Alamance Community College uh, total bond debt. So our total debt as of July 1 is $53.2 million. So we have to budget <coughs> for payments uh, for next fiscal year, uh, the $9.8 million figure that you see. And of that $9,858,983 $9, will be our debt payments for next fiscal year. Of that $9 million, you can see there how it breaks out. The county's debt payment for its own installment loan debt is a little over $2.3 million. Alamance Burlington School System for uh, our, pay, our payment, the county's payment for Alamance Burlington School System's debt next fiscal year will be a little over $5 million. And then for the community college, the county's payment for the community college's debt will be a little over $2.5 million. And again, these are, these are figured payments that we must make. Right. We have no, no recourse they're, they're other there, than, right? yes, we have to make these. But we want to demonstrate to you, and our legal debt margin, is now a little over one billion dollars. I think you remember last year we were at 900 and well, no, it's one. I get confused. It was one 999 billion last year. Million. Million. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. yeah. So, so hopefully we're not hitting a tree. Now. Oh, that's yeah. <laughs> but our base is our base has grown. Yeah. As our base grows, our uh, legal. You know business. what most people don't realize? I'm not in favor of debt. Trust me, but most people do not understand that is minuscule compared to uh, we're in a we're in a. Uh, a group of counties, population-wise, the, the highest next to the mega counties, Wake, Forsyth, and so forth, so on, it, are above us. But we are probably in a, in, in a list of, and it doesn't mean you that, that it justifies going out and borrowing more money, but it certainly uh, is worthy of being noticed. We, out of about 22 population centers that we're in with, that's probably, for all intensive purposes, if you look at a couple of the factors, well, we're equal with, there's two below us, or there's one equal to us and one below us. So technically, you know, we're at the bottom of, of counties in the money that we owe. And all the counties have the same obligation, schools, courthouses, uh, uh, health departments, social services departments. It, we've all, they've all got the same obligations, and we have managed ours about as conservative as yeah. it can be done, and, and it never gets noted. Somebody called the radio show the other day and just blasted the fact, and I couldn't believe it. He used to, well, I won't get into saying but, but who he is, but he blasted the fact that we owed any money. Hmm. I thought, my gosh, your pension's being paid by a government agency that yeah. owes a ton of money. Excuse me. But, uh, anyway, that, that's an unbelievable figure, in my opinion. You get what we pay for. 
Well, I think, uh, well, now, I'll challenge that comment a little bit. bit. Somebody made the reference one time that, uh, you know, you, it, it, at our tax rate, and it was, it, in my opinion, it was a uh, sarcastic comment. Uh, I'll just be blunt about it. It said, what do you expect for 58 cents? Well, that's not how you run government. I mean, you, you run government and then set the tax rate based on what it takes based, to pay based, for. Based on your so, needs, that's you know, correct. I, I don't, uh, I don't mm. think our rate has caused us to have a, a poor quality of uh, <clears throat> government infrastructure. Not to say we can't do better. Certainly. Certainly could have done worse. Very good. Thanks a lot. So uh, again, just a reminder, we, we uh, are not including Alamance Pearl School System uh, numbers for fiscal year 18-19 at this point. You know, that'll be presented to the commissioners uh, on April 16th. But what you see here is a reflection of the current year. Uh, 40, 40, a little over $40.6 million for current expense and $1 million in capital outlay for the school system. And again, we'll see uh, those folks on April 16th and they'll be uh, presenting their budget request to the commission. And the community college, same, this, these figures represent uh, Alamance Community College's uh, fiscal year 17-18, our current fiscal year uh, allocations, current expense $3.2 million and $440,000 for the community college and capital outlay. Uh, Dr. Gatewood will be coming to uh, make his presentation on April 16th also. So all the rest of the outside agencies that do not include school system, not including Alamance Community College, we have 22 outside agencies that have requested funds uh, from the county government. Uh, the total request from outside agencies is $3.3 million. Um, these, these agencies are funded in, in multiple different ways. Uh, in fact, in your budget snapshot, the very last page of the snapshot is the full list of all of those uh, uh, outside agencies. And we fund these folks, some of their funding is grant money that just passes straight through county government. You can see the pass-through funding. Those are not county dollars. Those are state or federal monies that just come to us. We're the, we're the, the conduit that distributes it out. A little over $1.6 million uh, of that 3.3 is going through that way. Um, we also have uh, agencies that get funding from the county that they use as match for those funds. Uh, I believe we have four of those that are getting county funds as grant matches. That total dollar amount is a little over $240,000. Those are county dollars going to outside agencies that use uh, those funds as a grant match. And we have uh, five agencies this year that have requested uh, over $811,000 in occupancy tax funds. We were speaking of occupancy tax earlier. I think. 1718, our proposed, our estimated occupancy tax figures was $770,000. That's what we pr uh, projected for occupancy tax. So you can see we have uh, a request of 811. We have not made a projection yet for what we think occupancy tax will come in at. We'll look again as we get closer to managers recommended. That'll help us decide what, what to do with these funds. Of that, of those occupancy tax, uh, two thirds goes to the uh, uh, CBB, the trans. Uh, Tourism Development Authority, and we keep one third and are able to give those funds to various operations. This year we have a new request. Uh, in the past we've had uh, the Alamance uh, Historic Museum, uh, the Sword of Peace, the Arts Council, and uh, yes, the Parks Department. This year we have an additional group. Uh, the African American Cultural Arts Center has requested $69,500 from occupancy tax funding uh, to help them with the museum and cultural arts center that they are planning, I believe, in the city of Berlin. And we have uh, 11 other outside agencies that are requesting funds. Again, they're all in the snapshots. A uh, total of $657,728 for outside agencies. We do have two new requests this year for funding for outside agencies. Uh, one is a $3,000 request for a group called One Step Further. And the uh, second request that is new, totally new this year, for the Exchange Club's Family Center, a uh, total of $24,863. Um, in, in the past, we've had outside agencies come, make their, each one of them come, make their individual uh, presentations and requests to the board. If the, if the commissioners are interested in doing that, 
we would uh, want to schedule that on April 16th also. So I would like to make a motion that we close the acceptance of outside uh, companies coming and asking for government funds. Yeah. I don't think the taxpayers should be paying for all these outside funding. Do you have a list of the ones you've included? I think it's getting out of, yeah. it's getting out of hand. They, we, we can't keep funding all those additional corporations or companies coming in asking for government handouts. Because I read yesterday, sort of piece probably isn't even going to open this summer. Yeah. Um, that funding. If you if you look at the the document, it looks like this. The very last page in that handout is the full list of all the outside okay. agencies that are requesting. So, yeah. and their their request forms are in your. We didn't print them out for today because it's a pretty large file, but they're in the packet that was emailed to you. If you want a hard copy, we can get that for you. But that list, you have a uh, ACTA, the Transportation uh, Authority. Mm -hmm the African American Cultural Arts and History Center, the Airport Authority, Alamance Arts Council, Alamance County Community Services Agency, Alamance County Family Abuse Services, Alamance County Mills on Wheels, Alamance Elder Care, Chamber of Commerce, the Exchange Club Family Center, the Forest Service, Alamance Historic Museum, the North Carolina Symphony, One Step Further, Piedmont Conservation Council and Snow Camp Historical Drama Center. These are these are all the outside agencies that are requesting <coughs> funds. The new ones are uh, African American Cultural Arts Center, Exchange Club Family Center, and One Step Further. Are there right. any in there that we turned down last year? We don't turn them down. We just keep well, adding some. Them. We didn't. Well, we, yeah, we there didn't were turn down allied, allied churches yeah. last year. Oh, there we, there we was a. There was a uh, also a, a home uh, band group that I can't remember the name of now that requested young right. musicians. Oh, young musicians. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, there are a few. We uh, didn't so receive one from them. I would just like to offer a different perspective on the value. Th these aren't outside companies. These are a lot of these organizations are um, the, the work that they're doing. They're all nonprofit, first of all, or they're government authorities, uh, and the work that they're doing either add to the economic development, and some of them you listed in, in that, in that um, not this show, I guess, not that. In, in here. Yes. Okay. Uh, you listed those th that are involved with economic development, and they're crucial. Yes. Some of them are uh, <clears throat> enhancing the quality of life of our community that makes us more attractive to outsiders to come here, outside businesses and all. Some of them are providing very important functions that if they weren't there doing it, it would be up to government to do it. And so in a way, we're, we're leveraging private donors who also help to support these organizations to provide those functions. And, and they, many of them wouldn't survive if it wasn't for a little bit of help that we give. And in the grand scheme of things, it really doesn't uh, make up a very big percentage of our overall operating budget. So to me, in the whole, not that we shouldn't scrutinize each request, um, but but I, I think that we, I wouldn't want to blanket, make a blanket policy that we don't accept or, or we don't provide uh, assistance to these organizations that are really valuable to our community. I would, uh, two comments I think I would make just for the board to consider. Uh, one, I think this year it would be extremely difficult to give any outside agency that received funding this fiscal year more next year. Uh, I think. From what I'm seeing, the best we can hope to do in 1819 is give them what they received in county dollars in 1819. I think that would be that will be very difficult to do, but that will be probably the more realistic goal is to fund at least what we funded, right? Uh, the other thing I think we probably should think about is right now we accept uh, we accept requests from anyone in, in the community. So it, you know we don't we don't have a filter. That we do have a cutoff date, but we haven't limited to say. Own the whoever's funded as of 1819. That's it. We won't even consider other requests. We do open it up. So um, I guess what I'm trying to communicate is a number of these have asked for new county dollars, additional county dollars on top of what they have received in the past. Um, I just want to be sure I'm clear to communicate to you and to the ones who are listening too that it will be very difficult for us to to fund them new county dollars if they have been getting county dollars. So it's not impossible, but it's it's it'll be difficult to do. So, so I would hope on the African American Museum, I, I think that's a really important addition 
uh, to this community that we can balance the dollars that we have from the occupancy tax it, and hopefully there'll be some increases there is because more people are coming and staying here that we can help maybe we can't do the full request and maybe we have to compromise some other requests to make it all balanced with the you know the organizations that currently receive funding that way but I think that's one the one outlier to these outside agency requests is uh, if it's grant funding that's passed through and it increases that's that's the state and federal government's decision and we we, we increase their budget and pass it through the other is the occupancy tax dollars uh, we trend that every year so we'll be looking at it as, as we get closer to uh, managers recommended on May 7th if we see that we're continuing to trend up we, we may have more occupancy tax dollars to put in the mix and then uh, the folks that have asked for additional occupancy tax dollars including the cultural historical center may be the uh, the, the ones to, to receive it we're actually working on an internal process to put together how to make those kind of decisions that you know we give a two-thirds of occupancy tax dollars go to the tourism development authority and then they have their own processes for how to who gets it after that the dollars the county keeps by let by law we keep one-third uh, we really haven't had much of a process in place to decide how it gets how it gets divvied up but the reason I think has been because we've always just had the same folks ask for it we're starting to get more people asked for occupancy tax dollars so I think we're going to come up with internally uh, a process to figure that out to say okay we need to make a recommendation to the board about who gets additional occupancy tax dollars and we need to be able to tell you why we think two-thirds of it goes to whom the tourism development authority and where are they located they're here in Burlington uh, they're made up of hoteliers uh, it was but a red yes okay. and, and in that group do we have a list of maybe some of these that are already getting funds from that and coming back to us for our share of that I think Brian might be able to speak to that is the, the uh, CVB is now a, uh, I think a year ago or maybe two years ago the CVB became a function of the Parks Department so yeah, I'll, I'll go to the Convention Visitor Bureau which is part of the Parks Department now we give out small amounts of money right now we're giving out $5,000 grants for advertising so we're going to be doing that for about two years and we're going to be doing that for about two years for the most part it goes to the operation of the Convention Visitor Bureau with uh, some occasional grant funds so what relationship do you have with the battle ground? None. None. We don't give. Do we don't give any money to elements battle ground? Not through any of our occupancy tax dollars or any other funding. I think they're state-supported agency through Department of Cultural Resources. Mm -hmm. uh, they get marketed, I think, through the CDB. Mm -hmm. They're one agency that just applied for some marketing grant funds, uh, and therefore considering that. Is it forbidden or is it uh, just? Policy. No, I think it's just been, you know, they've relied for a long time on their funding to come from Department of Cultural Resources with the state. I think you know, that, that department over the past three years has seen some, some significant reductions. In fact, I think the Cultural Resources has closed a few sites around the state of North Carolina. So it's a very reasonable and permissible thing for them to come and apply to the Convention Business Bureau for funding to help them with brochures or uh, some marketing <coughs> to be done for them. That's, that's a reasonable request. Oh, I'm not knocking it. Yeah. Mr. Haygood, has the uh, deadline for the outside agency request for this budget time, has that gone? When was that? Yes. Uh, and we're due back in on March 1st. So um, that would kind of, I don't know if Mr. Lashley's <coughs> concern was particularly for this year, not accepting any more requests and cutting off mm -hmm. um, people coming. Yeah, I'd like to see it stop. Well, it's, it stops, but it, yeah, it grows every year. It's just, I'd like to say it's just stop and accept them and take care of ones that's already already on our on our radar. Well, one question I would have for the board is, do you, do you desire to have a rep from each one of these agencies come and present on April 16th? It will be a, that's going to be a long evening. I don't want to shortchange those groups. But, you know, my role here today is to kind of present to you the information about county government, try to represent county departments, with the information I've given you, make sure folks are available that you can ask questions. Uh, if April 16th is going to be a busy evening. Lots of I'm not trying to dissuade you from doing it. I'm just making sure you know it could lead to a long evening. We would have, or we could ask if you desire a rep from each one of these uh, to come and make a presentation to you specifically about their request. And as staff, we're good either way. Um, but that's really the next opportunity for them to come uh, before May 7th when I'll be giving you a recommended budget. I think that meeting is going to be long enough without adding more people to speak. Could we possibly ask them to be on hand in case someone had a question? 
certainly to the funding that we would be doing with them yes I, I'd be more inclined to do it that way yeah. really yeah. I you know I'm pretty familiar with all most of these right. probably all maybe close to all <laughs> of these organizations and and they provided a lot of detailed information that's in our yeah. electronic packet too I thought we had a policy that was set up about in Bill's concern and I, 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 Sympathize with it, uh, but we, did we set a policy up about how new people were to approach us? I mean, they're to fill out an application. Yes, yeah. and, I mean, is that, that sufficient? I mean, and that's what's in the um, in our electronic version, right. yeah, in the appendix of that file. Yes, still turn and, them down. Uh, I mean, yes, yeah. I'm not going to mention the name of the agency because I highly respect them and the person and what they do for our county, but they said and, and we, we, we used to meet and have them come in a, a boardroom over here okay I was in one of those meetings with you Tim now this the way maybe yeah but ago. this was before oh, that okay, yeah. and this person came in and literally slid the chair back and said it's this quote verbatim it's the same song and dance every year and I thought to myself, you might, that dance might have cost you a little bit there. But no, we didn't penalize, but it was an attitude that it was shocking. I mean, it's this quote, the same song and dance every year. And I thought, first of all, I couldn't believe I heard it, to be quite honest about it. And, and again, I'm not mentioning it. was just who, being honest. Uh, well, I think the respect level was just gone. And uh, that, that, just, that can't be when you're getting government tax dollars. I think that it's good when people have a request from their governments, but if it's a new agency, for sure, that they have the opportunity to present to the public and to the, you know, the government that they're requesting their funding from, to have the opportunity to address concerns and to, um, to be heard. So I think that's, that's good, good but this is kind of a different year <coughs> in the big scheme of things. And, Perhaps we could think about a way that we could adjust our budget calendar, our budget process to accommodate that. Certainly. Because I think it's fair for a person who's requesting money from the county to stand up and say what they want it for and Certainly. to justify themselves before the people who have the responsibility of meeting the needs of the whole county. I agree, and I think it's, I think it's especially true now that we're at a point where we're 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 actually <laughs> denying outside requests. Uh, you know, last year was the first time in some time I think Susan, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that we've actually denied a request for funding by an outside agency. Usually, it is the same folks, same groups, and they're asking for maybe additional funding. But um, and I think that's opened up the fact the 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 process to other departments. So. Uh, it will be important in the future for us to make sure we try to give them one, one way we talked about is maybe some kind of video production that they could do and then we could put online and you know each one of them have a make their case and you, you know you could give it to the board it's not quite the same as being there but um, we'll, we'll work on trying to find ways to make the, make their presentations more accessible but it sounds like what I'm hearing is uh, having them present on the 16th and you, you have all their information either in their snapshots or in their uh, applications if you have questions for them we will make sure they're all invited and have the opportunity to come um, uh, on the 16th and give you the chance to at that point ask any of the questions that you have. I know I learn a lot from my fellow commissioners questions and that they have different perspectives that I value and um, I think that the discussion is productive in itself I agree. okay Bruce okay uh, talk a little bit about revenue uh, for next fiscal year, our assessed value is uh, a little over $14 billion. Our, uh, so we're looking at an average growth of about 1.7%. Uh, tax department has projected a collection rate of 98.8% on uh, property taxes. Uh, we're looking at the very high 99.99 .99 collection rate on motor vehicles. Now the state is collecting those for us. Now uh, we're estimating property tax revenue uh, to be uh, over a little over 80 million dollars and if all this holds true for next fiscal year one penny on the tax rate will equal one million three hundred eighty five thousand four hundred and ninety four dollars so our revenue sources for this coming year uh, as I just said we're looking at a little over 80 million dollars in property tax that's uh, a 2.2 million dollar increase from this fiscal year or 2.83 percent 
sales tax, we're projecting right now $28.6 million in sales tax. That is an additional $1.1 million, uh, which is about 4% uh, greater than fiscal year 17-18. We may actually uh, increase this estimate uh, as before uh, the manager's recommended budget, and that would be wonderful if we did. It, provide, it would provide us with a little bit of extra revenue from the sales tax. In 17-18 for fund balance, we also use fund balance to balance the budget. Uh, we are budgeting currently over $6.6 .6 million, and I would, I would certainly tell the board uh, I, I will not plan to use more fund balance in the manager's recommended budget. Uh, we came very close to spending fund balance after 16-17. I think we were within about $130,000, which is the closest we've been in a very long time. So I think we're probably at the max amount of fund balance I would feel comfortable uh, budgeting. Uh, we won't know how 17-18 panned out until after the audit is done, so it'll be sometime later this year before we know for sure. But uh, after all this information we've heard about our bonds, our, the possibility of bonds coming, uh, the fact that we would really like to be uh, evaluated again for our rating, uh, one of the things they look at is your fund balance and how you're managing it. Um, I, would, I would certainly not want to budget any more than $6.6 .6 million in fund balance to balance our budget. Um, you mean another 6.6? Another .6? Well, that 6.6 that .6 .6 is in place right now to balance what we're doing for 17-18. Right. Uh, Do you think I, you're going to use that? I mean, you must I don't have think sense. I don't think we'll spend it. Actually, I think I th none of it. Well, I don't know. It. I think Susan would disagree <laughs> with me. Susan, Susan, uh, you speak to that. I'll let you. <laughs> that is one thing that we continue to monitor from month to month. Um, I, right now, I'm not anticipating that we would actually spend the 6.6. .6, but if we did, it would be a small fraction of that. We came within That'd 130 thousand be before. And so we, for 17-18, we have a 58 cent property tax rate, and we have balanced the budget using 6.6 .6 million. It's going to be extremely close. We don't want to spend fund balance. This is our free and clear money we can use for all kinds so of the only, other The only way you don't use fund balance is if you didn't spend as much as what we budgeted, or we brought in more revenue than what we budgeted, right? Exactly. Yes. And it's usually a combination of both. Folks have held their spending down, and the revenue came in higher. We just can't, we can't project higher uh, and be conservative. So. Right. Y'all would say that uh, I, I would. I think 6.6. .6, that's as high as I would feel comfortable going. So, so speaking of fund balance, our uh, now this is based on 16-17 uh, information, 16-17 audit. Our current unassigned. That's our. I call it free and clear because there's so many different types of fund balance. It's hard for me to keep it in my brain straight. So to me, it's free and clear fund balance. It's at a little over 26 million. That is 18.3 percent of expenditures. Now the the commissioners have a goal of reaching uh, 25 percent, but we are not there yet. We're on our way. But uh, if you'll remember, we talked about this as we were doing these capital planning uh, information. We we designated some funds, the peak funds, 3.4 million, and the animal shelter funds, 2.9 million. We designated those, so that took our free and clear down. That, that, we didn't spend it, but it, we, we, by designating it, it's no longer totally free and clear. So you can see there that in the past, you see how we have budgeted fund balance and the amount we have, we have gained. So in 16-17, we budgeted 5.7 million and we gained 1.6. That means we didn't spend our 5.7, we actually got back 1.6 more. But of that 1.6, 1.5 million of it was sales tax revenues that had to go over into the school system's uh, capital reserve. So about $130,000 is, is, is what we made over, we were that close to spending fund balance. So again, my hope is actual gain or loss for 17-18 is, is nothing, it's a line. We didn't spend any, we didn't make any, we just held, held our own for 17-18. So all this information that I've gone over with you this morning, just to recap, total requests from county departments, uh, outside agencies using this year's uh, numbers for school system and community college, total request $155,641,453. We're estimating right now a total revenue of $149,752,434. That may go up based on how we see the next uh, month or so of sales tax revenues, that, that could go up. But the difference currently where we stand is $5,889,019 between the amount of requests and the amount of revenue that we're estimating. If we were to try to fund all of those requests based on the amount of revenue that we're projecting here, it would take an additional four and a quarter cents on the property tax rate based on 
1819's property tax rate that you saw just a moment ago to balance that budget. And again, please remember that these requests do not include uh, the school system or the community college. And as you know, the board knows, we, go, we do this as part of our budget process every year. We always have a significant uh, amount of requests over what our revenue is for this time. And that will be part of my job to work with Susan, department heads, and you to get it down to where the budget is balanced. But we will be bringing you a balanced budget on uh, May the 7th. So. And that is our next, uh, our next meeting that has to do with budget will be May the 7th, uh, be 9 a.m. here. I'll bring the, uh, what I recommend to you, it will be a balanced budget. And then after uh, May the 7th, you won't have to take any action on it, of course. Uh, May the 21st is our public hearing. Uh, we'll have to, on the 7th, talk about where you would like to hold that budget. That's the budget public hearing. Folks get to come and speak on the recommended budget. And then I believe it is June the 7th will be the first opportunity the Board of Commissioners has to vote on approving the budget. Uh, and then we have another opportunity in June to goal being to get it approved and adopted before July 1. So, um, so I'm here this morning. I can answer any questions about this information that you've seen. We also have department heads here. Uh, uh, if you, but uh, at this time, I would like to uh, ask the sheriff if he would like to step up and say a few words about well, his may budget. May I ask a question Sir, first? Yes. Because he's included in this, then you can come up yes. if, you, if you want to after. Uh, Go back to the uh, budget request where you're showing a projection of four point whatever cents increase. All right. Now, first of all, let me ask you a question. What was your charge to the departments when you asked them to prepare their budget? So this year, I took the 17, 18 figures for, for departments' budgets. Uh, I asked finance to add uh, to that number the new uh, contributions we have to make for employee or I feel we have to make for employee health insurance costs. That, that each department sees that added into their budget. That was added. Then also asked the finance to add for each department the dollar amount that was going to be required for the workers' comp fund issue. That, has, that was added in. Then also asked finance to add uh, into uh, the emergency service departments a 2.1% pay increase for those departments. That bottom line number I called managers pre-recommended. The departments were given their budget packages. That number was highlighted. This is the prereq. This is what I feel like might be balanceable, if that's a word. Anything, and I asked them to demonstrate anything over that that they needed, because I want, I want the departments to feel comfortable asking for uh, the equipment or the material or the persons that they need, because this is their only opportunity to do that. And I have to let you know, because uh, they, they're asking for this, because you represent the folks that these services are for. So the, the goal was to see where you came in at around what I call managers pre-recommended. Um, so the departments, I think, did a very good job. Uh, the departments understand that we're looking at the possibility of a significant property tax increase if bonds pass. So we know that that's a possibility. Um, I think they did a good job holding the line. But uh, some of them uh, have needs that we have to we have right. include. You, the prerequisites that you stated that was part of your charge, what's the difference between your prerequisites and the difference? The, uh, the 5.9. So the prerequisite balanced at the time we did it based on the revenue projections that we had at that time. So what I gave departments was a dollar figure called prereq that included these few increases that I feel are necessary. Uh, and that was a balanced budget, but that was a very preliminary balanced budget. So uh, at that time, that budget wasn't requiring a tax uh, increase at all. And understand we didn't have the figures from outside agencies either, which they have gone up. Uh, and again, we had some uh, a number of requests that departments felt like I have to let someone know. All right, forgive me. Made. You talk real fast, and I'm a little slow. Uh, the prerequisites are you saying didn't re and, and, and if you didn't have any additions, that it would not have required a tax increase. Is that what you just said? Yes, the budget. What I call managers prereq included nothing but the the uh, uh, increase for health insurance, increase for workers' comp insurance, and a 2.1 percent pay increase just for emergency services. And, and you thought that all would have been paid for by increase in revenue without a tax increase? Yes, and it, it also I had to bear, I have to bear in mind that we still need to hear from ABSS and ACC. So what early on looking at revenue, new revenue. Uh, projections <coughs> very early my thoughts were could you take new revenue projections and break it out based on the percentage of of the budget that each each agency is county government school system and ACC and correct me if I'm wrong Susan I think what we came up with the managers prereq budget that was balanced based on revenue estimates at that time mm -hmm. 
given the departments just those very few increases that I'm talking to you about, the, the few. And it also gave a percentage of new revenue to Alamos Maryland School System and a percentage of new revenue to the community college. Very small amounts of revenue, but it, but it did, it balanced preliminary. So it went, the manager's prereq that we discussed with departments didn't require a property tax increase. Okay, all right, got to that. Now the 5.9 is above and beyond the prereq, right? Yes, and that's that. Okay, forgive me. Too. Now, in the past, we've had 10 million more, 12 million more requested versus the prior year. Many times, several times. But did those 10 and 12 million dollar increases over the prior year include the school system? Yes. Yeah, I thought it did. Uh, seat of the Bridges. What, what do you think the difference will be once we hear from uh, ABSS and, and community college system? I think last year we were at, at retreat. We were maybe 12 million over projected revenues. I, I, I suspect it will be close to that. Close to the same thing. Okay. Now, away from them, because we don't have performance-based budgeting in with ACC and we don't have it in with ABSS, and you got six, for all intents and purposes, six million dollars more. Uh, how does that square off with the fact that we've got performance-based budgeting in there that was supposed to hold those numbers down? Or, or, or are you going to claim that uh, that's, it would be higher if we didn't have performance-based budgeting in there? Well, the departments have made good use of performance-based budgeting funding for the past four years at least. Uh, they've bought a lot of capital, a lot of equipment that kept it out of uh, the budget request, right? So they use their savings to buy cars, trucks, equipment, things that go, make improvements to buildings. They didn't; have, those requests didn't have to go into the budget. The one thing that that has done is, uh, it, 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 we have taken our savings, which is free and clear fund balance, per the performance management program we designate, right? So we still have it as fund balance, but it has caused some reduction in the free and clear fund balance. So they've been spending it. Uh, would I say it would be higher? Uh, you know, we don't use performance management funding to pay for employees. And off the top of my head, I can't remember how much of that difference. That difference is for all count outside agencies and county government. And I don't remember off the top of my head the, the dollar amount of the new uh, employee request. But that's usually a pretty large portion of, uh, of additional requests. And we don't, we don't pay for that with performance management money. So. I, I, I got something I just want to point out as just a board of election, if I'm reading this right, we've had, we've got a three million increase That's right. because of new voting machines. That's half of what you're looking at there. Is that, well, am I thinking right it, on well, that? Well, that won't hit until, uh, that, that is a, it is, is it part of this figure? It is part of this figure. So that three million dollars is in the 5.8 right. and we have to demonstrate the need and the request right. from the Board of Elections concerning their voting equipment. And this was state mandated, so it's we don't mandated. have a choice of um, spending that money. Exactly, and that's to let the commissioners know that that is an apparent need that we will need to face in 1819. We are examining ways that we can pay for that <coughs> to secure loans as well as possible grants. That that's a lot of money. I mean, that's half of what you're looking at in your increase. Right, so, so that $3 million is part of the 5.8. Right. So I noticed that that was put in the operations and not capital. Why, why wouldn't it be a capital expense? Well, I think what we're, did you want to speak to that? So you I can. Going ahead. Um, it will eventually become a capital expense, Commissioner Bird. Um, but at this point in time, we're in the operation because if we are taking out an installment loan, then that will be moved over to the debt service. So it would not impact their um, expenditures. For the capital, because so that might so, so that, so that would take three million, <laughs> right? Right off the Because when the loan is secure, we would have a budget amendment that would increase our budget for the proceeds. We would expend those, so you would see them there in the capital, and then for the further years, you would see it in debt service. So you're that's right. You're looking at maybe two, two point eight million dollars yeah. in, in increases, and I, and also over out of a, you know, the county, county government budget was around ninety six million dollars. So if, if let's just pretend all of that 2.8 was just for county departments, and it's not because some of us from outside agencies, I just can't remember. I think it's maybe let's say 2.5 million of that difference is for county county departments. Out of a 96 million, uh, I think we were 90 93 million last year 
in county government costs, county department costs, a $2.8 million increase is not that much percentage-wise. It's a lot of money. It's $2.8 million. But in a $93 million scope of operations, it's not that much. I, I will say I think departments have done a good job this year. Listening to me talk about managers pre-rec, I've tried to communicate to them the situation the county finds itself in this year about uh, you know the possibility of bond debt coming and uh, the fact that we could be looking at larger tax increases in another year. So I think that they have listened to me and heard that and have done an excellent job <coughs> trying to keep their requests low, but they still have things that they need to ask for. I think uh, uh, you know uh, we've had some, some of these issues are pressing. Farmland preservation is one of them. I mean, the longer you wait to buy farmland, it's gone or it costs more. The DSS needs for their, uh, uh, their child protective service workers, that's a pressing need. So I think they've held it to requests for new stuff that is, that is pressing. Speaking of farmland preservation, I saw that we had a contribution to the, the nonprofit organization of a small amount. Uh, but weren't we setting aside some uh, in our budget for directly to put into the program for purchasing the easements? Yes. Uh, 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 could we, I think <laughs> we were asked for $250,000, and then I thought you said, we well, we're going to set aside a hundred. Yeah. Yeah. So we is have, that in, this, in that? It, it is. The manager's prereq included, you know, for 17-18, we're already putting $50,000 in that program, mm -hmm. and uh, the manager's prereq included an additional 50000 So, so uh, we were trying to look early on at, could we afford to do $100,000? And I know um, uh, Mr. Bell came and made a very clear case for why $250,000 is needed and that the revenue could be available through present use value program too. So again, that will be another item that we will be looking at as we work through the rest of the day and work toward a balanced recommended budget from me. Well, if you have no other questions, Thank you very much, and uh, I know I appreciate the department uh, doing doing such a good job, being uh, overall very very thrifty and reasonable with their requests. So. Was the sheriff going to? No, the yes, I'm sorry. Yes, we have three other folks to speak. I'm sorry. Good morning, commissioners. It's, it's sort of hard to follow this man here. I'm telling you. You know what, sheriff? Let me interrupt you. Um, we have gone one man down up here and how about before you get started why don't we take a five-minute recess? that sounds that. good because yeah. i think people are going to be following order please and resume our meeting we have the sheriff thank you commissioners for allowing me to speak briefly today and i hope to be briefly i'd just like to uh compliment our county attorney i'm county attorney yeah. county manager <laughs> sorry about that but, uh work way, real hard on recommended budget and I'd like, just like to bring up to date that the manager's recommend budget for the sheriff's office, I have three budgets. One's the sheriff, one's detention, and one school resource officer. The first one, his recommended budget was $12,249,849. This is the only budget that I'm asking that a small increase be allowed. And that small increase is going to be $16,200. And... That is for replacement of our uniforms. Uh, we had eight new deputies position that was unfrozen in January that we have to provide uniforms for, and also for our explorer post, which began about a year ago. Uh, and I'm asking for that increase of $16,200. Our detention center, uh, manager's recommended budget was $10,770,316. And we're showing no increase there. As a matter of fact, we're going to try to save some there, uh, and I'll explain that in just a minute. Our school resource officer's budget, which we work with the school system, and they fund part of it, $561,198, and we're not asking for any increases there. All we're asking for for total is $16,200 to Keep our uniforms uh, on our officers because uh, you, you have to fight somebody. Guess what gets torn off of you? <laughs> sure. That's right. And, and our officers I can need vouch for to that. Be, I remember those days. You guys getting ready to say? <laughs> they were rougher sometimes, I think, back in than they are now. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that's one thing we're asking for. And let me say this. The main reason I'm coming for you today is over the last three years, I have tried to meet 
uh, a conservative budget with, with our county manager. But I want you to know that next year, you've seen the four dispatchers that they're asking for. Well, guess what? If there's no deputies for them to talk to, there's no need for four dispatchers. Our call volume is increasing, and yes, they do need those dispatchers. But at the same time, we're going to have to have an addition of manpower, and I'm not looking for this year. I want you to understand that. Also, the turnover rate. I don't know if, if Brian would address what was the, what's the number one agency and turnover rate, and number two agency, if you've got it. The number one turnover position in county government is Detention Officer 1. Uh, number two is uh, Income Maintenance Caseworker 2, DSS. And number three is Deputy 1, Sheriff's Department. So our top three positions, two of them are uh, Sheriff's Department or Jail. Can you give percentages on those? I can get you that information. I don't have the turnover percentage, but we have that. And see, what, what it's doing to us and to the county is you having to rehire, rehire because you're losing these people and the training costs a lot of money. Uh, right now we have 10 opening positions and we were over 20 some. Well, when you take 10, say out of the detention center, two things are gonna happen. And it did happen to us. One is we're gonna wind up getting an officer hurt because not having enough people uh, to take care of the population. Now, I I've, I've, you know, have to make a choice right now we're holding marshal prisoners. This year, from July to February, we brought in $1,095,137.24 just with marshal prisoners. We're holding state misdemeanor prisoners. From July to February, we brought in $627,804.90. Randolph County, their jail was overcrowded, and we agreed to hold some of those because we had some bed space. And we helped their inmates from July to December, $110,320. But we had to stop holding them due to our staffing problem. We had to send them back. Stokes County, we were holding all, uh, some of their inmates from July to December, $37,600. Part of that was they had to stop holding them for staffing problems. We had to close the old Alamance County Prison Unit, which is an excellent place to house individuals, but because of staffing problem, which cost us money we were getting from those counties, plus we had to shut that uh, down, and we're doing repairs now that they shut down to, so we don't have to go back through a bunch of other stuff with the state to open it back up. <clears throat> so what I'm seeing is that, uh, you know, we want to work with the county and we're trying to, and it's been a, a pleasure working with Brian and his staff. Last year, we gave up 12 cars so the school system could have that money. Uh, we bought cars out of federal drug assets. Our federal drug assets money is dried up. They owe us a bunch right now, but it's not coming down from Washington, D.C. So my re main reason today is to ask y'all to look down the road when we come back next year. We're going to hold to the our manager's recommended budget, even if he takes the $16,000 out, which I hope he won't. But I'm going to be back before you next year begging because our people in this county has got to stay safe. We're having a tremendous problem right now with gangs. The cartels have moved in here and set up shop. Drug traffic, opioids is just eating us alive. And if you think that is all being developed right here in Alamance County, it's not. It's coming from the border, the heroin is, and with the fentanyl and a lot of other things. And we have a major problem here that we're going to have to address. Next year, I'm going, and I hope you're still here because I don't have to go over this again. <laughs> but <laughs> I, hope, may not I hope that y'all will help us plan <laughs> to meet some of our needs next year. Let me year. ask you something. What's yes, on, sir. What's the deal on the 287G? Clyde's got a contract from them. Again, he's looking over it uh, to, to make whatever changes needs to be, and that's where we are. If, if that program does come back, we will reopen the detention center. There's 80 beds down there that, that we can hold inmates that will, you know, uh, will offset the cost to the operations of the jail and to the taxpayers here in Alamance County. 
How how will you do staffing though? You're, you're short staff already. We got we're gonna have to hire these. That we you know, like I said, we've got okay. a total of ten openings. We have uh, uh, four, five, six in detention, and four on the outside. Uh, you to run a two A C M G program, you're gonna need about eight people to do that. I, and another question: When these deputies or whatever exiting as fast as it seems they are. Are y'all tracking where they're going? And yeah, the other agents. Kind of, and Do you realize pay difference Alamance County Sheriff's Department starts off much lower than any agency, law enforcement agency in the county, with an exception of Hall River Police Department. I think we need to make note of that. I think you do too, but I mean, yeah, I'm not I mean, quite this, smart. That, that might be the case in a lot of our departments. So. Well, that's possible. And, but and I, I don't disagree, I'm just talking but, about the, top ones but that the problem we have is that when you're when you're losing these people, you're losing a lot of trained officers. Secondly, we have 435 square miles to cover, and I think our response time we figured a little over a year ago was like seven minutes. I assure you it's gone up because the call volume's gone up, the serious calls are coming in, and uh, sometimes uh, I've honestly come out and some of my other people have come out when I hear it on the radio, they're holding calls. You don't hold calls when somebody's in trouble. No. We have to be able to respond. And, you know, I'm just asking you all to be thinking about this over the next year because I'm going to be back before because I have a responsibility to protecting these citizens. And uh, as you see, uh, they, they do need uh, four dispatchers there because just one second can mean the difference between a person's life or living. And that's our responsibility, folks. That's our responsibility. Thank you for your time. Well, we, and I have a little remark to make. Um, we've seen the the change in population, the increasing population in Alamance County and how that's affected our garbage service. We've had a lot of problems with Republic Waste Services, which I hope have been addressed. I haven't been getting those complaints anymore. And Mr. Hill from the landfill is not. And yes, they seems like they're doing much better. But um, if the garbage can sitting at the road day after day is an indication of how much our county is growing and how services need to be adjusted, Think about this instead of garbage cans that were people with somebody rustling around in their bushes. <coughs> if that was somebody who um, had a problem with drugs being sold in their community and how that increase in population affects law enforcement and those really vital vital services. So Well if you don't think we're growing, go out to green level. On 49, look at all those houses down in there. Uh, go down Rogers Road, and I could go on and on and on. And that's the increase people moving in here. And I'll tell you why people moving in here. We are a wonderful county. Uh, we have what I think is is a, a, a medium low tax bracket, and people want to move here. We've become somewhat a bedroom community in a lot of ways, and. Uh, we, we need to look at these issues and address them. And certainly, I'm very proud to be from Alamance County because of what we've been able to do with our, our tax monies. But, you know, as we grow, why do you think they need a new high school? Why do you think the schools are getting overcrowded? That's because people are moving in. And my last thing I'd like to say, look at a quarter cent sales tax. Everybody has to pay that, including those individuals that are coming from the counties in here shopping and those individuals that may not be residents here but living here. They have to pay. Our farmers, uh, you know, and our elderly can't pay a lot of taxes. Your marshals program, uh, keeping marshal prisoners, are they in with the other prisoners or are they separate? Yes, we uh, uh, felons are, are grouped together, misdemeanors grouped together, and some marshal prisoners we keep totally separate. Have you figured out a cost of keeping them versus expense? The last time I well, figured, I expensive. figured a cost was, uh, I think it was li uh, like forty-seven dollars and something, and we get right at seventy dollars, but. They also pay all medical pertaining to that prisoner unless it's aspirin and stuff like that. 
What what about like from other counties? What is well, our rate? Well, we uh, the the state pays us forty dollars misdemeanor to keep the state misdemeanors, and that's what we charge the other counties. I we did that because of fellow shirts. If I ever need anything, all I got to do is pick up the phone, and call them. Uh, and we're not making, uh, didn't, don't, not making a whole lot of, uh, I won't say making money. It's offsetting. We've got to have air conditioner, heating, the same st uh, staff uh, to work those pods and stuff. So actually that, you know, you're, you're making money when it's not intentional to, to make money. That's what it's not intended for. It's kind of like a hotel. You don't it is. You all see, you're offsetting right. the cost to the taxpayers yeah. of Alamance County when yeah. you hold inmates like that. Uh, I did talk to uh, the Marshal Service the other day, and, and they're looking at uh, renegotiating the contract because right now we're the lowest paid agency in the district here for keeping federal inmates. Does Hillsborough get more? Sir? Hillsborough, Orange County? Do they keep? Do they get more? Yes, per, sir. Per. Sure do. Sure do. Mm -hmm. well, I'd just like to point out that uh, our Stepping Up initiative is, is one of the objectives is to free up jail space that you can use for these other yes, sir. Uh, services that you provide to other counties, and some of that revenue can come to the step to help pay for the cost of the stepping up initiative. And I love that because I'm a you know I've been wanting this for a long time, Mr. Burke. Thank you. Any questions you may have? I think that's it, Sheriff. Thank, Thank you very you much. So much. Yeah, I'm sure I think the health department also wanted to make a comment about their budget before the Department of Social Services. Okay, great. Health department. So the sheriff thinks it's really hard to um, follow the county manager, but I don't think there's anything <laughs> harder than following the sheriff. <laughs> so uh, with that said, I just want to echo a little bit of what the sheriff said when it comes to how the health department looked at their budget as well, and, and we try to be very conservative. Um, and what we ask for and so I hope I won't take too much of your time because um, it's pretty straightforward and I do appreciate Commissioner Gailey's comments about growth and evaluating our county services um, we see that as well in uh, public health when it comes to the economy growing uh, the need for environmental health services increases and uh, particularly in North Carolina right now as we're seeing a changing health care system with Medicaid transformation that that might also change the, ch the landscape of what local public health looks like so I appreciate that. I'll start with just the um, health department budget, which is essentially a zero increase in budget. Um, you are seeing a 2.13 increase uh, percent increase, and that really is attributed to what the county manager went over in the personnel costs when it comes to the health insurance and the workers' comp. That that is essentially the increases that we're seeing in our budget. Um, the only real change here or, or highlight is that we are asking for capital outlay, which um, Mr. Haygood also um, touched on here in the amount of $13,920. Um, that is for two refrigerators and one freezer. Um, a few months ago, I came and asked for some, P, uh, some performance management money. We have a total of um, four refrigerators and two freezers, and at that time I asked for half of them to be purchased through performance management. Uh, we're asking for the other half of them to be purchased here through our budget for fiscal year 19. Um, the current equipment is about 15 years old. It is uh, going out of temp often. It's malfunctioning. It's starting to break down. Uh, we're at risk of losing a great deal of inventory in uh, immunizations. We have an inventory of about $300,000 worth of vaccine um, that if we were to lose is quite a big <coughs> chunk of money for our department. Um, and not counting the staff time and resources it takes when the um, equipment goes out of temp. That requires phone calls, alarm systems to various staff to come and um, check the actual equipment, maybe even move the vaccine based on how badly the um, temperatures are malfunctioning or that the equipment is malfunctioning. So that's the health budget. What's um, the cost of those refrigerators? The refrigerators, um, the total for the refrigerators and the freezers are 13920 uh, that, that, You know, I don't understand how these little things are such a long-lasting need. Uh, I know a person that used to work at the health department before you came here. And what was the guy's name that was? Barry. Yeah, Barry. And the, she told me she's retiring. Same issue. And I, it, that's hard for me to comprehend. I mean, you either need it or you don't. And somebody ought to be addressing it. 
Yeah, we've made, him, we've made them last a fairly long time. Yeah, but I don't understand why we just... Having to call that repairman off. Right. I heard this story about the refrigerators. God, <laughs> when Barry was here. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> oh. So that's the health department budget. Any questions, further questions about that one? The other two are pretty straightforward. Um, Dental Clinic and WIC both are um, the the parts of the health department that don't use any local tax dollars for their operating budgets. Dental, um, the biggest change here is in the personnel costs that we did switch from having two full-time county dentists to one full-time county dentist who is also serving as the dental director. Um, and then the rest of the dentists will be through contract, which is actually a, a cost-effective measure for us. And then the WIC program, um, there are no real um, statements to make about the WIC program. Nothing really changes there. Questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. DSS, Ms. Austin. Good morning. Um, Good morning. So this morning you're going to hear from um, three of us, not that we have a lot to say about our budget, <laughs> but there are a lot of things that are changing at social services and you as our um, governing board um, need to be aware of those things. Um, so I, I want to first just highlight um, a couple of things as we get into this. Um, we, there are some legislative changes that will matter um, for for social services and for you as county commissioners. And I want to talk about those very quickly. Um, and then you're going to hear from Adrian Day, our deputy director, who is going to highlight the child welfare crisis. Um, very similar to um, Chair Gailey's comments about folks moving in, they bring children. And so we're going to talk just a little bit about that. Um, as well. And then um, Kelly, our assistant director, is going to go over the numbers. Um, the important thing to know is that we took very seriously the county manager's charge. So our budget is flat except for those positions in child welfare. So um, let me hit some highlights here. Um, you have a handout. You probably have too much information in front of you. But you have a handout, particularly um, this is a county commissioner. Um, prepared document, the first document after our PowerPoint. And what it does is it defines what House Bill 630 means to local governments. Um, and so there is a work group appointed by the General Assembly. I serve on that work group. There are three DSS directors across the state and I represent the Directors Association. Um, that work group is being run by the School of Government and we're working on several parts of the legislation and recommendations. But the important thing for you to know is that in 2018-19, so July 1st of this year, you will have to sign, a, you, the county commissioners, um, will have to sign an agreement with the Department of Health and Human Services about the performance of your DSS. Um, and we will all be held accountable um, as you can see in that bullet, um, if we don't um, meet guidelines, then the state will have um, permission per the legislation to withhold federal and state funds. Could, could you give a little bit of the background behind why this bill was introduced and passed that might help put it in context? Sure. Um, there were some cases in North Carolina that um, <coughs> were concerning um, in counties related to child welfare performance. And a couple of our legislators looked at those cases and they felt like one of the concerns is consistency across all counties. So that's one reason that these um, county agreements are being drafted. Now, did you want to talk about the, the whole intent with Ryan's Law? And well, may, maybe just a little bit, but I mean, but child welfare is an issue statewide. Yes, There's that's what I said. They looked at a couple cases. A lot of variation they took a from look, county to county. The lack of consistency. Right. Um, and so these working agreements are to establish consistency. There's a lot coming with House Bill 630. Um, what one of the key issues that was identified, I didn't mean to go into this much detail, is that um, the state writes policy and then they have no ability to um, 
monitor and train as counties need. And so the first year of this working group has been to help develop what counties need to um, provide consistency, improve performance, and meet the needs of children in child welfare. Now for, uh, for you, this working agreement means that you will sign as the county commissioners that you are ensuring that there's appropriate staff, that you're ensuring that um, <coughs> children are safe and protected, you're ensuring that our court, you know, that we're moving children to permanence timely, benchmarks um, that, that will, that really define outcomes for children in Alamance County. So keep that on your radar screen. That's the first big policy change um, related to can you can you tie that into the issue that came up years ago about the report cards? You remember that? Yes, sir. So <laughs> yes, so thank you. So basically, it takes that legislation around Medicaid and report cards and applies it to the rest of the agency. Okay. Right. So if you fail three of five of five of twelve three in a row, they, the state can come in right. and take over. So Here. now they're not doing it, right? Is that what you're saying? Right. They can do it in Medicaid. They have some ability in child welfare, but none in the other parts. House, House Bill 630 applies to the entire agency, even though the focus initially was child welfare. This also applies to um, adult protective services. It applies to child support, all areas of the agency. Though, so the, the working agreement that you'll be asked to sign has benchmarks for all parts of our agency. <clears throat> other than Medicaid because that was already established yeah. in that report card. Process. How long ago was that report card issue? Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, so that would have had to have been about 2004. That far back? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Well, you know, it, it can help you, but it can hurt you too. I mean, you know, because yes, you, you do get in to compare and, and you do look at, because uh, that, that issue did create a, uh, an analysis of the computer system, you know, versus yes. what others were using that were. That's right. And, and we were able to, with some additional staff and some increase in technology, um, and you'll be glad to know we've passed that report card the last where's that here? five, six months in a row. Yes, right. yes, uh, it, at 98%. How many categories were in that report card? Two. Right now, just, just two, okay. Right. Two, yeah, it's all applications, and we all have right. another report card for recertifications. All right, we'll talk later about that. Okay. <laughs> Um, so the next big issue, and you have a handout on this, um, this is a letter from the Division of Health and Human Services that says, and this was passed in the last budget bill, um, and we're just getting policy about it. But basically what it says is if we make an error, the county, social services, eligibility workers, that number two turnover position, or number one, number two, the IMC2s, if we make an error, um, and and it's reviewed by the state. Then the different the amount that was granted in claims for a for example for a case that was ineligible, um, but we granted eligibility in error, we will have to pay back the state and federal share. Um, the the feds offer a threshold of <coughs> error of 3.2 percent to the state but this bill does not give a threshold of error to the counties. So we are at 100%. If the state reviews as a part of the single audit we were talking about earlier, or um, the new, a new state audit of Medicaid, if we, don't, if, if we um, have made an error in a case either way, um, then we pay back the, the state and federal share of, of the Medicaid claim for that ineligibility period. Particularly, now the good news is last year in the single audit, we only had $146 worth of error. Um, the bad news is it's really our long-term care cases that are complex. They involve assessing trust, assessing lifetime rights, all of those things. And then once you make a determination um, for a long-term care case, that's about $7,000 a month. So if you've been in error for an eligibility period of 12 months, you can see quickly that's $100,000. Um, so this is new. Um, as I said, our most recent audit was $146, so we'll have to pay that back. But this is a new liability and also included in, in um, the 
responsibilities in the agreement that we'll, you'll be signing. Um, we are working on some strategies in our long-term care to audit and do a second party review to try to eliminate that liability as much as we can. Um, so I'm going to turn this over to Adrian, and, and I, I just want you to, as she goes forward, to remember this new responsibilities that you'll have to sign with Child Welfare. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the crisis that we're experiencing in Child Welfare right now. Mr. Haygood talked about um, our social worker INT positions being one of our high turnover <coughs> positions. And you can see, so we have 40 positions in our Child Welfare division. 19 of those positions have turned over within a 12-month period. Of those 19 positions, 14 of those are our investigation positions. These are our first responder positions. These are the social workers that respond to the reports of child abuse, neglect, and dependency. These social workers have to respond based on time frame set by general statutes. So it's not a situation where we say, so this social work, all of our social workers have gotten a report today. We don't have anybody else to take that report. We don't have that option. So our caseloads have actually become very high, and I'm not going to hit each bullet. I'm just going to talk in general. Yes. Maybe like the sheriff putting a sh deputy on hold because that's right. right. We don't have thing. that option. Yeah. Um, and, and it's a crisis kind of could be a cri that's life, right life threatening could be a life threatening. Absolutely, situation. absolutely. Um, a lot of our social workers actually respond <coughs> with the sheriff's department and our local law enforcement because of the situations that children are in at that time. Um, our caseloads right now, most of our social workers in, those, um, in that area of investigations have doubled the state mandated caseload. State says that one social worker should have 10 cases. M many of our social workers have 20. <coughs> Prior to us implementing um, abbreviated <coughs> investigations and documentation, we had social workers that were almost three times as high as the state says that we should be. Um, so the other thing that has had a great impact on that area has been FMLA requests. Um, within a six month time frame, our own call position, that's the position um, <coughs> that that social worker works from 5 p.m. to 8 a.m. They work weekends and they also work holidays because we, have, we are a 24 hour response when um, we receive a report of child abuse, neglect, or dependency. That position was vacant for six months. So that meant that our social workers who worked during the day had to cover that position at night after working um, during the day. Um, so some of the efforts that we've made to address the crisis in child welfare, um, we always look when we have a vacant position, where is the greatest need for that position? Is it still in that area? So probably last year around um, late, late summer, early fall, we started receiving concerns from our community stakeholders saying, we need to make a child abuse report and your phone is always busy. We cannot get through. So what we looked at is we had a retirement um, in our adoptions area. That was an area that that position <coughs> wasn't needed at the time. So we moved that position to our intake position so that we could designate a line for some of our community stakeholders, our law enforcement, our judges, um, crossroads. So those those um, partners of ours who really need to make that report and they need to make it right then and there. We have assigned, um, our here lately, our foster care numbers have been low. I say that, um, last two weeks they've actually trended higher. But um, that area has been low. So we looked at the number of positions that we had there. So as those positions became vacant, we moved those positions to investigation. So, um, currently, we have moved two positions from foster care to investigations to meet the need um, there. I'll actually go back. I skipped one important part on this um, first slide. So, and, and lots of moving parts at the state right now. So, the state actually took the, our current number of social workers that we have in our investigations department. They looked at the number of social workers we have, and they also looked at our workload, our current workload. When they did the calculations, they estimate that Alamance County needs 10 additional investigators to be able to handle the workload that we have currently. Um, so knowing that, we did try as much as we could to address those issues. We've added clerical support so that they could take some of the administrative duties from the social workers so that they could actually um, respond to those cases. So what we're proposing, um, we have actually been approved and have completed 
classifying all of our social workers the same. So that allows us that if our foster care numbers are low and we can maybe move a social worker <coughs> for 90 days, six months, then we move them. Um, and that doesn't require as much paperwork internally. Um, and, and, and also it doesn't impact Graham as much because you have to actually adjust salaries and um, things like that. So we actually are requesting three social workers in our investigations department. With that, we're asking for one supervisor. The state says um, that we should be at one supervisor to five social workers. We are currently um, one supervisor to six social workers right now. So we would need an additional social worker. One of the things that's coming to Alamance and it's coming really fast is NC Fast. Don't know if you know much about the um, government computer system that um, is has been implemented in our economic services well it's coming to child welfare that's going to require all of our child welfare social workers to have a minimum of 50 hours of training to prepare for this new computer system that we're receiving in addition to the annual work agreement that susan was just referring to there are actually additional performance mandates that we will have to um, train our staff in when that comes in july and so that's my crisis in child welfare. Are there any questions? So I thought I'd seen this on hard copies. Is this online? Have we got this in our package? Yeah, yeah. it is in your package. And it's on the agenda? Yes. Because yes. I've, I've gone through it two or three times. I still can't see it. So maybe I it's missed it. It's under DSS. It's after the, um, after the, the budget presentation. Okay, as long as it's on here, good. It Let is. me ask you a question. I think when the state requires, or not requires, but the mandate well they suggest standards <laughs> that's right standards and I think that's how you allude to them that's right. uh, and it doesn't <clears throat> what others that are doing doesn't necessarily justify what we need to do or aren't doing or, or could do but but I would like to know are there comparisons to other counties across the state as far as what those standards are uh, versus like what are they telling another county they need and so forth and so on I mean so I'm not sure Susan I don't know if you know from other directors what they've been told so every month we have to input our numbers into a child welfare data book right. mm -hmm. and there's one produced for every county mm -hmm. and so that's where the <coughs> numbers come from so every county puts them in um, and that goes straight to the state yes to, to yes and then that creates the data book that the state has and, and they have um, one for every county. So does it show where they're, and, I'm sorry. And the mandate is the same, one right. to 10. So it's one to 10 in investigations, one to 10 in in-home, and one to 15 in foster care. Well, I was just gonna ask, how do we compare to other counties? Is everybody having uh, issues like we're having and needing more so staff? So Durham County um, just added, I think five, <coughs> four or five, I don't know what the final, I know they were asking for five, but I'm not sure to take them to one to 10. Uh -huh. um, so yes, but the other issue of course is, um, is vacancies. That turnover rate is a statewide issue. Um, Cumberland's at about 50%, Guilford's at about 45%. Wow. So the turnover issue is statewide. Um, so if I understand you right, Adrian, um, so we have the states, Susan, one of you, I thought said we needed to add 10 yeah. staff. According to the state but, calculations. Yeah, but you're saying that you're because of um, having everybody with the same qualifications, that gives you the flexibility to meet those ratios by being able to move people around. That's so, right. So you're helping a lot by doing that. That's right. Yes. yes. And we feel like we can do it with, um, so with this it will be a total of third. five new workers because mm -hmm. we've moved two from foster care. So five. And then we have one and a half that are doing on call, which helps support them as well. And they don't, they don't show up in that um, workbook as having a caseload. So it depends on individually how each individual county might use their on call worker. We feel like we're using ours to the max. Um, but a foster care increase, you need to kind of replenish those, that staffing a little bit, right? We took, um, we took nine children last week. They had nine children coming to foster care last week. That's a, so that's, that's a lot. And that's two-thirds two -thirds of a caseload case in After one we week. we shifted two <laughs> workers yeah. out of that area. You know, I, sometimes I wonder, uh, I don't know what the solution is, but, <laughs> you know, we're dealing with individual cases here. But uh, what can we do 
as a prevention so that we don't our community doesn't produce the need to have so many child abuse cases to begin with I mean is it poverty driven is it education driven so the um, the children that Susan talked about that we removed last week um, those were those were um, substance abuse um, so so mm -hmm. some of this is substance Absolutely. abuse related so we can, we can attack that mm -hmm. Of course, How we're going to have we're going to have another opioid abuse summit coming up, right? That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Stacy, what's the date? May seventeenth. May seventeenth. Mm -hmm. That's correct. And that the goal of that work, workshop day is to come up with strategies and solutions. That's what we need is is to figure out how to stop. In this childhood trauma, the, the resilience movie is all about, that might be feeding yes. into it as well. And there's a federal level change for the first time in the Family First Act that will um, allow for some prevention. Prior to this, social services has only been reactionary, um, other than a few grants that we've gotten, but our state dollars and our federal dollars have been reactionary mm -hmm. to the abuse and neglect. So we're looking at opportunities to take some of our funding and draw down some different reimbursement for prevention for the first time. Mm -hmm. If I remember right, at a DSS board meeting, you had a presentation from your person who's in charge of the anger management program. Yes. And that was with Larry. very interesting and informative and a good example of prevention mm -hmm. and helping people learn to manage stress and learn to manage anger in a way that doesn't traumatize their families and we do have a prevention grant currently that we're working on it it's our community response um, prevention grant and that is um, working with families and now it only identifies children zero to five but it's working for children who have had a CPS report but there were no findings and so that our social worker is allowed to go into that home and to work on things whether it's parenting or um, looking at tra childhood trauma issues and uh, trying to alleviate some of those issues so that those children do not come back to the attention of Child Protective Services. <coughs> so to Kaylee's point, let me just add that we keep a waiting list for that program. We do. You know, Larry is a, and we absorbed him from judicial services when that divested at the county. <coughs> and so he keeps a waiting list of um, men um, and, and women. Um, he is interested in starting a women's group as well for um, domestic violence abusers. All right. Thank you. The family justice, family justice center. What do you, to what degree do you think that drops those numbers? Or? So, um, I would. So the sheriff and maybe Tim could answer that better than I. But you know, we've seen a decrease overall. You know, that used to be our number one reason for child abuse and neglect mm -hmm. was domestic violence. Mm -hmm. um, so that's come down. The opioids come down. have gone up. Unreal. Yeah. Um, Unbelievable. Okay. Well, we'll do just delve into the numbers a little bit. Um, this handout that you have at your place is a more detailed account of the fluctuations within our budget. Um, but we'll hit some highlights right now. So, when we look at the big picture, for 18-19, we are estimating $59 million will be spent in DSS programs and services in Alamance County. And of that, 7.9 is the county dollars. Um, you'll notice that the very small piece of pie is the state dollars. Um, that's about 4.8% of that total budget. The biggest piece of that pie is um, food and nutrition and program benefits at 34 million. Okay, so here is our proposed budget. And we took the county manager's um, advice in keeping flat with the addition of two areas, workers comp, and our health insurance. So that is an increase of 204,000 um, over our last year's adopted budget. And that is um, was our target. And um, like many county departments, we saw within contracted services, inflation and janitorial service and record storage um, and our interpreter services, all those things just in the economy that were increasing. But we are remaining flat at the 7.9 million in county dollars. So back to this slide, you'll see that our overall expenditures and revenues have been decreasing, and that is largely because of pass-through funds. <coughs> um, so three programs mainly. Um, our energy programs, we are seeing a decrease of about $109,000 um, coming this next budget year. 
Um, and we hate that for our citizens. That's less money we'll have to help them in their energy crises during the cold and, and hot times. Um, also, our daycare subsidy, that used to be about $7 million of pass-through funds in our budget. Now we're down to 700000 that we keep in as an emergency in case we were asked to make payment. That's all done out of NC Fast now. Um, in addition, Medicaid transportation is out of our budget. It's paid out of NC Tracks now. That used to be about 700000 and we budget just $10,000 now um, for those funds. Um, as we've talked a lot about foster care, so our numbers of children in care are decreasing right this second, so <laughs> increase. Um, so this year we budgeted 958000 uh, we're on track to spend about 572. Um, we've budgeted 625,000 for just those kind of. Um, we can turn on a dime with that. With taking nine children into custody, we have to be able to respond to that. So that is hence our, our budget of 625 this year. Um, we are seeing um, our case mix of children who are eligible for federal reimbursement, which is about 84 percent. That's increased a little bit. This was a, a change from last year. Um, but right now we are in target for 64% of our children are federally um, eligible for that federal reimbursement compared to the state reimbursement of 50-50. Um, interesting to point out, um, children can stay in care from ages 18 to 21 now, but we are seeing state funding decreases um, related to our teen population. Um, also, adult services is an area that we've had really big growth in. So back in 2005, we had 64, sorry, 74 guardianship cases, and we're currently at 116. So this is the caseload of an additional adult services worker. Um, we are trying to look at a contract service provider that we are already using to absorb that growth. And so that's what we've um, planned for in our budget, and that's um, an increase of 40,000 absorbed within our 7.9. Um, also, with that growth, we see um, unreimbursed adult protective service line. We're asking for more money in that line. Um, and then there are two allocations from the state that have decreased. Um, adult daycare down by 7000 and then our adult home specialist has a small decrease in funding. So, in addition to our performance management goals, we also have an agency work plan that is all about customer-centered focus. So when you look at our budget, um, there are some areas that you'll see increases in related to training and relating to efficient use of technology. Um, and of course, we want to keep our trauma-informed focus. Um, so you will see increases in training of staff of about $19,000. Um, keeping our technology up to date is very important. Um, we have scanners that are 10 years old that are starting to drop, so we're budgeting to replace some of those. Um, and also, as we move into the NC Fast world, um, we will need cellular access on our iPads so that our folks will have those in the field and be able to communicate in real time um, with their record keeping. Um, we also need to make sure our document management um, system is ready to meet the demands of NC Fast, so that is an increase. Um, one area that we were not able to include in that flat budget is cameras. We had hoped to, as part of our safety assessment, to add cameras to the building and grounds at HSC. Um, that's not currently in there. Um, we're still trying to figure out if there's any way we can, out of this year's budget, um, make that happen, as that's very important. Okay, I'll turn it back over to Susan. Okay, so this is just to, um, we talked about child welfare, so these are the numbers, about $128,168 um, $168 in county funds to support those positions, that's after our revenue. And we have made a commitment to the county manager that um, we'll continue to look for areas of reduction in our budget to try to offset that 128000 but that would be the addition in our budget um, over being flat. So, um, so when you add that in, our county dollars at eight million. Um, so we'll be glad to answer any questions. But that's our presentation. That strikes me as being pretty reasonable, given all the requirements and challenges. We've <laughs> got, got a lot of activity within that hundred twenty-eight thousand dollars. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you so much for that. Now we have to do some work.
with these bonds. <laughs> um, I guess Mr. Haygood is going to help us walk through this process. I know we have some detailed motions that are requested to move this process further along. Yes, so, ma'am. What do we got to do here? So you'll notice on your agenda you've got several items, and we're just going to walk through them one at a time, uh, and I'll try to explain to you what, uh, what each one of these items uh, are as we go along. The very first item on your agenda uh, that is pertaining to the bond proceedings is the introduction of bond orders for Alamance Burnham School System and Alamance Community College. This, this does not require a vote. But uh, it, it has to be introduced at this meeting and put before you. You'll see we'll take some action pertaining to it again a little bit later. But this uh, bond order reiterates that the max not to exceed amounts are $150 million for Alamance Burlington School System and $39.6 million for Alamance Community College. This uh, bond order also says that the board is uh, assuring uh, the public and the LGC that taxes will be levied in a sufficient manner pay for the uh, bonds if they were to pass. The uh, bond order also says that there will be a sworn statement of debt filed uh, by the finance officer here shortly, um, but it does put that out there. And it says that the bond orders will be in effect when they are approved by the voters. So if you have any questions about this particular document, there is no action required for it. So what's different about this document than what we already passed at our last meeting, was it? We passed so, uh, resolution, didn't we? Yes, this is... Susan, you want to speak to that? Um, what this document is doing is, it is one of, as Brian was saying, it's one of the motions that we'll get to in a minute, but it will designate me to file the sworn statement of debt with the clerk. And at that point in time, we can continue our, with our LGC proceedings. These are all just logistical Step. steps that need to take place to get to the referendum. It also assures that the commissioners have the ample opportunity to think about this process, <laughs> to give it thought, feel comfortable with the amounts. We're, we're still moving through the process, but it's a, it's a defined waypoint. So if there are no, any, no questions about this particular, particular item, we'll proceed on, if that's all right, Madam Chair. Sure. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the sworn statement of debt. There is a vote required um, for this action. This will designate the finance officer as the officer whose duty it shall be to make and file with the clerk to the Board of Commissioners the sworn statement of debt of the county, which is required by the Local Government Bond Act, as amended, to be filed after the bond orders have been introduced and before the public hearing thereon. So uh, if, you, if you are willing to proceed with this action, you would need to vote to designate uh, Susan Evans, our finance officer, uh, to make the, uh, present the sworn statement of debt to our clerk to the board. <coughs> and this is the details of the current county debt? Mm -hmm. That's correct. And it does require a vote if, if there are no questions. So we're seeking a motion to designate the finance officer as the individual to file the statement of debt and statement of estimated interest. That's correct. I'll make that motion. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all um, signify by saying aye. Uh, aye. Uh, Any opposed? <clears throat> Thank you. What's next? Next item on your agenda is a statement of estimated interest. Uh, there is a vote also required for this item. Uh, this, this statement uh, lays out the amount of interest we anticipate if both bonds were to pass at their stated amounts, $150 million and $39.6 million. The total interest we are estimating uh, to, that we would be repaying on these bonds if they were successful at the poll is $89,662,091. Remember, we've talked about structuring and lots of other ways. This is the conservative level principle estimate of interest. So we feel like this is uh, this is a reasonable amount to estimate as interest. So I see an interest rate of four and a half percent. Is that the was that the assumption that Davenport used? Yes. Okay. And again, that could vary in time, but for for the current purposes, that's the uh, percentage uh, that we've used. And and that's based on how you structure out that debt a yes. lot. Yeah, well, and, and now this, this will be based on level principle. Level principle. That's okay. correct. Okay. But that, so this does not mean you cannot investigate the structured principle, and we right. can use that if, we're, if the we, board so desires. So this is like the most conservative assumption. Correct. And it, anything that we might do could. Would add to that. Well, or subtract, or be, be more favorable to the taxpayers. <laughs> yes. But add to the debt. 
Once again, when what's the last date that the amount can be decided? Below 150, I mean 150 or below? April 16th. April 16th. That'll be uh, after your public hearing. Right. Once you hear the public comments, then if you wish to change dollar amounts or make any adjustments, that would be the time. Well, I move that we approve this document here. Second that. It's a resolution, I guess, right? Yeah. Yes. I move that we approve the resolution. And then I'll second that, Bob. Great. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. What's next? So your next item on your agenda is pass the bond order on first reading for Alamance Burlington School System. This does require a vote of the board. Uh, so you, the commissioners, just a few moments ago, you had the bond order introduced. Uh, that was the very first item we did. No action was taken. You're now establishing by vote what the bond order said, that uh, the max uh, dollar amount uh, not to exceed for Alamance Burlington School System bonds would be $150 million. You're uh, again now by vote iterating that taxes will be taxes will be levied in a sufficient amount to pay for that bond if it passes. Uh, you're also indicating by your vote uh, that the sworn statement has been filed with the clerk of, to the board and you're also indicating by your vote that the order takes uh, effect if the voters pass it at the polls. So. Now, it, and I don't think I missed this when I stepped out, and I apologize for leaving. Uh, the sales tax referendum, now that's totally separate from any of this that we're doing here, right? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. and, and we've talked about, we have until <clears throat> mid-May to, to uh, take that to the Board of Elections. So in the next couple of meetings, uh, we're going to be preparing a resolution for you to consider because the consensus at our work session was the Board was interested in doing that. So. And, and I'd like to see that at our public hearing as part of that. Okay. I think that the April 16th meeting would probably be the best one to target yeah, for that, that to give us plenty good. of time. Yeah. Do we have to have a public hearing for a sales tax referendum to be on the ballot? I don't believe so. I think the board just passes the resolution that the That's county good. attorney would uh, to uh, put together. And, and then I've it's, seen the war he's put it together. Yes, I believe uh, Mr. Yes. Albright's prepared to have one for you. I uh, emailed you an example mm -hmm. last week. Yes. Good to know. All right, right now, I believe we're seeking a motion to pass the bond order on the first reading for the Alamance Burlington School System. I'll make a motion that we do that. I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Next. So your next item is the pass bond order on the first reading for Alamance Community College. Again, this item does require a vote. This is the mirror to the one that you just did. Uh, you will be establishing by vote that the bond order, uh, the bond for Alamance Community College will not exceed $39.6 million. You are, you are also establishing that taxes uh, shall be levied in a sufficient amount to pay for this bond if it were to uh, pass. You're also indicating by vote that the sworn statement of debt has been filed with the clerk to the board and that the order will take effect when the voters approve, if they approve, in November of 2018. So, and it does require a vote similar to the one that we just passed. So we would be seeking a motion to pass the bond order on the first reading for Alamance Community College. So That's moved. correct. That, I move that we do that. Second. So we have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? And I believe we have one more thing to do. Yes, Madam Chair, your final uh, action to take uh, on, as for today's bond proceedings is to uh, set the public hearing for the bond referendum. Uh, we're recommending that you set that public hearing 7 p.m. on Monday, April 16th, 2018. And at this time, we have discussed having this meeting at, the, uh, at Southern Alamance High School. So that would be the recommendation is to vote at this time to uh, set the public hearing for 7 o'clock April 16th at Southern High School. Do we know if Southern High School is available? No, uh, we do not know that. We've checked with the school system in the interim to, to see if it would be available or not. We weren't able to determine that. But if it is not, uh, the clerk has assured me that we would Mr. have time Van to change our location and advertise it with plenty of time to be legal. Mr. Van Pelt. Yeah, Steve have has. I did check with Dr. Ford. Uh, um, uh, we're we're uh, we're not in session today, and uh, he said he would check with Southern High School see if it was available and let you know. Okay. 
If, if it is not, we will be able to change the location and get the public notice out in plenty of time. We would contact the chair and let her know that if Southern is not available, we'll work to find another place. We wouldn't have, have a special vote on that, or is that? Not sure what the process would be if, uh, if the. You can set the date, time, and place, and you can change it if the circumstances are right. Just have to notify the public within 10 days. Yeah. So okay. this. So um, we'd be seeking a motion to set the public hearing on these bonds for April 16th at 7 p.m. Um, and then directing the clerk to publish those notices. That's correct. I'll make a motion that we move forward with that. A second. So we have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Hearing me. none, <laughs> uh, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? <coughs> Thank you. Now I believe we have some ministerial things okay. to be done by our <coughs> finance officer. Good almost afternoon, commissioners. <laughs> um, I bring before you this morning still the um, budget amendment for the Home Care <coughs> Community Block Grant. When we prepared the fiscal year 17-18 budget, we were using preliminary numbers. We have since received the 2017-18 actual numbers as well as a revision, and this is calling for an increase to our budget of $18,916. I move approval of the budget amendment. <coughs> I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. Her county manager has left the room. <laughs> he did have to step out, but he did want me to inform the board that he has no uh, report this time. I think he's time. done an excellent job. <laughs> Be sure to tell him sure that. Has. Yeah. <laughs> he certainly has. Um, so do we have any commissioner comments? Well, I'd like to say that uh, since the last meeting, week before last, I attended a two-day conference in Greensboro put on by the Association of County Commissioners and it was about um, the, the theme of this year's uh, association's work uh, per the association's president, Commissioner Brenda Howerton from Durham County and uh, her, her year project as president is helping 100, helping children in 100 counties thrive. And so this was a two-day conference where they had people presenting from all over the state about what they're doing to help children thrive in their communities. And uh, I learned a lot, and really I was kind of proud of what we're doing here in Alamance County because a lot of the things that uh, they were doing, like the Reach Out and Read program or the Dolly Parton program, we're already doing those things. Uh, one thing that I picked up uh, was that, um, that we're not doing, that I heard at another commissioner's meeting a couple of years ago, was to involving our youth in, in exposing them to county government and municipal governments too. So I think it was Randolph County that uh, has a, an agency that, uh, so that the municipalities and the, the county, uh, these students would participate in it over a period of time. It's kind of like our uh, Citizens Academy, uh, Tori, but this is, would be for children. And it might be a little bit more in depth, but uh, they come to every meeting and they sit right beside or in front of the dais and then they get to respond after the meeting's over uh, but they they go through the tour like you do with, with the citizens academy and it really gets youth involved uh, in understanding what government is and and that makes them better citizens in the future it may right. help to recruit uh, more people to put their hat in the ring to be uh, an elected official sometime uh, so I, i'd like to see us think about how it might be best structured in this community <laughs> That's all. Okay. We're, we're done now. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> very interesting. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ashton. I'm sorry, Dad. Do you have any commissioner comments? No, I have no comments. Mr. Southern Fossil. All right. Well, then let's be adjourned. <laughs> Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Meetings of the Commissioner's Board occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. Typically, the first meeting of the month is at 9 a.m. and the second meeting of the month is at 7 p.m. 
Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting is broadcast on Time Warner's public access channel on the second and fourth Wednesday of each month at 10 p.m. You can also access this meeting through our website at www.alamance-nc.com. Please visit our website for more information about watching meetings online. For technical questions regarding this meeting's online or television broadcast, please contact our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. Please note that this address is for technical questions only. Questions regarding the content of commissioners' meetings may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. Click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about our commissioners, read minutes of past meetings, access agendas, and find other information about the County Commissioners. You can send mail correspondence to the Commissioners by sending it to the Alamance County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners meeting.